Book 12, Chapters 5 through 7 of The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3 by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book 12, Chapters 5 through 7. Chapter 5 how, upon the quarrels one against another about the high priesthood, Antiochus made an expedition against Jerusalem, took the city, and pillaged the temples, and distressed the Jews, as also how many of the Jews forsook the laws of their country, and how the Samaritans followed the customs of the Greeks, and named their temple at Mount Gerizim the temple of Jupiter Hellenius. About this time, upon the death of Onius the high priest, they gave the high priesthood to Jesus his brother, for that son which Onius left, or Onius the fourth, was yet but an infant. And in its proper place, we will inform the reader of all the circumstances that befell this child. But this Jesus, who was the brother of Onius, was deprived of the high priesthood by the king, who was angry with him, and gave it to his younger brother, whose name also was Onius. For Simon had these three sons, to each of which the priesthood came, as we have already informed the reader. This Jesus changed his name to Jason, but Onias was called Menelaus. Now as the former high priest, Jesus, raised a sedition against Menelaus, who was ordained after him, the multitude were divided between them both. And the sons of Tobias took the part of Menelaus, but the greater part of the people assisted Jason. And by that means, Menelaus and the sons of Tobias were distressed, and retired to Antiochus, and informed him that they were desirous to leave the laws of their country, and the Jewish way of living according to them, and to follow the king's laws and the Grecian way of living. Wherefore, they desired his permission to build them a gymnasium at Jerusalem. And when he had given them leave, they also hid the circumcision of their genitals, that even when they were naked they might appear to be Greeks. Accordingly, they left off all the customs that belonged to their own country, and imitated the practices of the other nations. Now Antiochus, upon the agreeable situation of the affairs of his kingdom, resolved to make an expedition against Egypt, both because he had a desire to gain it, and because he contemned the son of Ptolemy as now weak, and not yet of abilities to manage affairs of much consequence. So he came with great forces to Pelusium, and circumvented Ptolemy Philometer by treachery, and seized upon Egypt. He then came to the places about Memphis, and when he had taken them, he made haste to Alexandria, in hopes of taking it by siege, and of subduing Ptolemy who reigned there. But he was driven not only from Alexandria, but out of all Egypt, by the declaration of the Romans, who charged him to let that country alone, according as I have elsewhere formerly declared. I will now give a particular account of what concerns this king, how he subdued Judea and the temple. For in my former work I mentioned those things only briefly, and have therefore now thought it necessary to go over that history again, and that with great accuracy. King Antiochus, returning out of Egypt for fear of the Romans, made an expedition against the city Jerusalem, and when he was there, in the hundred and forty-third year of the kingdom of the Seleucidae, he took the city without fighting, those of his own party opening the gates to him. And when he had gotten possession of Jerusalem, he slew many of the opposite party, and when he had plundered it of a great deal of money, he returned to Antioch. Now it came to pass, after two years, in the hundred forty and fifth year, on the twenty-fifth day of that month, which is by us called Chaslu, and by the Macedonians, Apelius, in the hundred and fifty-third Olympiad, that the king came up to Jerusalem, and, pretending peace, he got possession of the city by treachery. At which time he spared not so much as those that admitted him into it, on account of the riches that lay in the temple but, led by his covetous inclination, for he saw there was in it a great deal of gold, and many ornaments that had been dedicated to it of very great value, and in order to plunder its wealth, 
he ventured to break the league he had made. So he left the temple bare, and took away the golden candlesticks, and the golden altar of incense, and table of showbread, and the altar of burnt offering. He did not abstain from even the veils, which were made of fine linen and scarlet. He also emptied it of its secret treasures, and left nothing at all remaining, and by this means cast the Jews into great lamentation, for he forbade them to offer those daily sacrifices which they used to offer to God according to the law. And when he had pillaged the whole city, some of the inhabitants he slew, and some he carried captive, together with their wives and children, so that the multitude of those captives that were taken alive amounted to about ten thousand. He also burnt down the finest buildings, and when he had overthrown the city walls, he built a citadel in the lower part of the city, for the place was high and overlooked the temple, on which account he fortified it with high walls and towers, and put into it a garrison of Macedonians. However, in that citadel dwelt the impious and wicked part of the Jewish multitude, from whom it proved that the citizens suffered many and sore calamities. And when the king had built an idol altar upon God's altar, he slew swine upon it, and so offered a sacrifice neither according to the law nor the Jewish religious worship in that country. He also compelled them to forsake the worship which they paid their own God, and to adore those whom he took to be gods, and made them build temples, and raise idol altars in every city and village, and offer swine upon them every day. He also commanded them not to circumcise their sons, and threatened to punish any that should be found to have transgressed his injunction. He also appointed overseers, who should compel them to do what he commanded. And indeed many Jews there were who complied with the king's commands, either voluntarily or out of fear of the penalty that was denounced. But the best men, and those of the noblest souls, did not regard him, but did pay a greater respect to the customs of their country than concern as to the punishment which he threatened to the disobedient, on which account they every day underwent great miseries and bitter torments. For they were whipped with rods, and their bodies were torn to pieces, and were crucified while they were still alive and breathed. They also strangled those women and their sons whom they had circumcised, as the king had appointed, hanging their sons about their necks as they were upon the crosses. And if there were any sacred book of the law found, it was destroyed, and those with whom they were found miserably perished also. When the Samaritans saw the Jews under these sufferings, they no longer confessed that they were of their kindred, nor that the temple on Mount Gerizim belonged to Almighty God. This was according to their nature, as we have already shown. And they now said that they were a colony of Medes and Persians, and indeed they were a colony of theirs. So they sent ambassadors to Antiochus, and an epistle, whose contents are these, quote, To King Antiochus the God, Epiphanes, a memorial from the Sidonians, who live at Shechem. Our forefathers, upon certain frequent plagues, and as following a certain ancient superstition, had a custom of observing the day which by the Jews is called the Sabbath. And when they had erected a temple at the mountain called Gerizim, though without a name, they offered upon it the proper sacrifices. Now, upon the just treatment of these wicked Jews, those that manage their affairs, supposing that we were of kin to them, and practiced as they do, made us liable to the same accusations, although we be originally Sidonians, as is evident from the public records. We therefore beseech thee, our benefactor and savior, to give order to Apollonius, the governor of this part of the country, and to Nicanor, the procurator of thy affairs, to give us no disturbance, nor to lay to our charge what the Jews are accused for, since we are aliens from their nation and from their customs. But let our temple, which at present hath no name at all, be named the temple of Jupiter Hellenius. If this were once done, we should be no longer disturbed, but should be more intent on our own occupation with quietness, and so bring in a greater revenue to thee." Quote. When the Samaritans had petitioned for this, 
the king sent them back the following answer in an epistle, quote, King Antiochus to Nicanor. The Sidonians who live at Shechem have sent me the memorial enclosed. When therefore we were advising with our friends about it, the messengers sent by them represented to us that they are in no way concerned with accusations which belong to the Jews, but choose to live after the customs of the Greeks. Accordingly, we declare them free from such accusations, and order that, agreeable to their petition, their temple be named the temple of Jupiter Hellenius. End quote. He also sent the like epistle to Apollonius, the governor of that part of the country, in the forty-sixth year and the eighteenth day of the month Hecaterabeum. Chapter 6 How, upon Antiochus's prohibition to the Jews to make use of the laws of their country, Mattathias, the son of Asimonius, alone despised the king and overcame the generals of Antiochus's army, as also concerning the death of Mattathias and the succession of Judas. Now at this time there was one whose name was Mattathias, who dwelt at Modin, the son of John, the son of Simeon, the son of Asimonius, a priest of the order of Joarib, and a citizen of Jerusalem. He had five sons, John, who was called Gaddis, and Simon, who was called Mathis, and Judas, who was called Maccabeus, and Eleazar, who was called Auron, and Jonathan, who was called Apphis. Now this Mattathias lamented to his children the sad state of their affairs, and the ravage made in the city, and the plundering of the temple, and the calamities the multitude were under, and he told them that it was better for them to die for the laws of their country than to live so ingloriously as they then did. But when those that were appointed by the king were come to Modin, to compel the Jews to do what they were commanded, and to enjoin those that were there to offer sacrifice, as the king had commanded, they desired that Mattathias, a person of the greatest character among them, both on other accounts, and particularly on account of such a numerous and so deserving a family of children, would begin the sacrifice, because his fellow citizens would follow his example, and because such a procedure would make him honored by the king. But Mattathias said he would not do it and that if all the other nations would obey the commands of Antiochus, either out of fear or to please him, yet would not he nor his sons leave the religious worship of their country. But as soon as he had ended his speech, there came one of the Jews into the midst of them, and sacrificed as Antiochus had commanded. At which Mattathias had great indignation, and ran upon him violently with his sons, who had swords with them, and slew both the man himself that sacrificed, and Apelles, the king's general, who compelled them to sacrifice, with a few of his soldiers. He also overthrew the idol altar, and cried out, If, said he, any one be zealous for the laws of his country, and for the worship of God, let him follow me. And when he had said this, he made haste into the desert with his sons, and left all his substance in the village. Many others did the same also, and fled with their children and wives into the desert and dwelt in caves. But when the king's generals heard this, they took all the forces they then had in the citadel at Jerusalem, and pursued the Jews into the desert. And when they had overtaken them, they in the first place endeavored to persuade them to repent, and to choose what was most for their advantage, and not put them to the necessity of using them according to the law of war but when they would not comply with their persuasions, but continued to be of a different mind, they fought against them on the Sabbath day, and they burnt them as they were in the caves, without resistance, and without so much as stopping up the entrances of the caves. And they avoided to defend themselves on that day, because they were not willing to break in upon the honor they owed the Sabbath, even in such distresses. For our law requires that we rest upon that day. There were about a thousand, with their wives and children, who were smothered and died in these caves. But many of those that escaped joined themselves to Mattathias, and appointed him to be their ruler, who taught them to fight even on the Sabbath day, and told them that unless they would do so, 
they would become their own enemies, by observing the law so rigorously, while their adversaries would still assault them on this day, and they would not then defend themselves, and that nothing could then hinder, but they must all perish without fighting. This speech persuaded them, and this rule continues among us to this day, that if there be a necessity, we may fight on Sabbath days. So Mattathias got a great army about him, and overthrew their idol altars, and slew those that broke the laws, even all that he could get under his power. For many of them were dispersed among the nations round about them for fear of him. He also commanded that those boys which were not yet circumcised should be circumcised now. And he drove those away that were appointed to hinder such their circumcision. But when he had ruled one year, and was fallen into a distemper, he called for his sons, and set them round about him, and said, O my sons, I am going the way of all the earth, and I recommend to you my resolution, and beseech you not to be negligent in keeping it, but to be mindful of the desires of him who begat you, and brought you up, and to preserve the customs of your country, and to recover your ancient form of government, which is in danger of being overturned, and not to be carried away with those that, either by their own inclination or out of necessity, betray it, but to become such sons as are worthy of me, to be above all force and necessity, and so to dispose your souls, as to be ready, when it shall be necessary, to die for your laws. As sensible of this, by just reasoning, that if God see that you are so disposed, he will not overlook you, but will have a great value for your virtue, and will restore to you again what you have lost, and will return to you that freedom in which you shall live quietly and enjoy your own customs. Your bodies are mortal and subject to fate, but they receive a sort of immortality by the remembrance of what actions they have done. And I would have you so in love with this immortality that you may pursue after glory, and that, when you have undergone the greatest difficulties, you may not scruple for such things to lose your lives. I exhort you especially to agree one with another, and in what excellency any one of you exceeds another, to yield to him so far, and by that means to reap the advantage of every one's own virtues. Do you then esteem Simon as your father, because he is a man of extraordinary prudence, and be governed by him in what counsels he gives you. Take Maccabeus for the general of your army, because of his courage and strength, for he will avenge your nation, and will bring vengeance upon your enemies. Admit among you the righteous and religious, and augment their power. When Mattathias had thus discoursed to his sons, and had prayed to God to be their assistant, and to recover to the people their former constitution, he died a little afterward, and was buried at Modin, all the people making great lamentation for him. Whereupon his son Judas took upon him the administration of public affairs in the hundred forty and sixth year. And thus, by the ready assistance of his brethren and of others, Judas cast their enemies out of the country, and put those of their own country to death who had transgressed its laws, and purified the land of all pollutions that were in it. Chapter 7. How Judas overthrew the forces of Apollonius and Saron, and killed the generals of their armies themselves. And how when, a little while afterwards, Lysias and Gorgias were beaten, he went up to Jerusalem and purified the temple. When Apollonius, the general of the Samaritan forces, heard this, he took his army and made haste to go against Judas, who met him and joined battle with him, and beat him, and slew many of his men, and among them Apollonius himself, their general, whose sword, being that which he happened then to wear, he seized upon and kept for himself. But he wounded more than he slew, and took a great deal of prey from the enemy's camp, and went his way. But when Saron, who was general of the army of Celesyria, heard that many had joined themselves to Judas, and that he had about him an army sufficient for fighting and for making war, he determined to make an expedition against him, as thinking it became him to endeavor to punish those that transgressed the king's injunctions. 
He then got together an army, as large as he was able, and joined to it the runagate and wicked Jews, and came against Judas. He came as far as Beth Horon, a village of Judea, and there pitched his camp, upon which Judas met him, and when he intended to give him battle, he saw that his soldiers were backward to fight, because their number was small, and because they wanted food, for they were fasting. He encouraged them and said to them that victory and conquest of enemies are not derived from the multitude in armies, but in the exercise of piety towards God, and that they had the plainest instances in their forefathers, who, by their righteousness, exerting themselves on behalf of their own laws and their own children, had frequently conquered many ten thousands, for innocence is the strongest army. By this speech he induced his men to condemn the multitude of the enemy and to fall upon Saron. And upon joining battle with him, he beat the Syrians. And when their general fell among the rest, they all ran away with speed, as thinking that to be their best way of escaping. So he pursued them unto the plain and slew about eight hundred of the enemy. But the rest escaped to the region which lay near to the sea. When King Antiochus heard of these things, he was very angry at what had happened. So he got together all his own army, with many mercenaries whom he had hired from the islands, and took them with him, and prepared to break into Judea about the beginning of the spring. But when, upon his mustering his soldiers, he perceived that his treasures were deficient, and there was a want of money in them, for all the taxes were not paid by reason of the seditions there had been among the nations, he having been so magnanimous and so liberal, that what he had was not sufficient for him, he therefore resolved first to go into Persia and collect the taxes of that country. Hereupon he left one whose name was Lysias, who was in great repute with him, governor of the kingdom, as far as the bounds of Egypt and of the lower Asia, and reaching from the river Euphrates, and committed to him a certain part of his forces and of his elephants, and charged him to bring up his son Antiochus with all possible care until he came back, and that he should conquer Judea, and take its inhabitants for slaves, and utterly destroy Jerusalem, and abolish the whole nation. And when King Antiochus had given these things in charge to Lysias, he went to Persia. And in the hundred and forty-seventh year, he passed over the Euphrates and went to the superior provinces. Upon this, Lysias chose Ptolemy, the son of Dorimenes, and Nicanor, and Gorgias, very potent men among the king's friends, and delivered to them forty thousand foot soldiers and seven thousand horsemen, and sent them against Judea, who came as far as the city Emmaus, and pitched their camp in the plain country. There came also to them auxiliaries out of Syria, and the country round about, as also many of the runagate Jews. And besides these came some merchants to buy those that should be carried captives, having bonds with them to bind those that should be made prisoners, with that silver and gold which they were to pay for their price. And when Judas saw their camp, and how numerous their enemies were, he persuaded his own soldiers to be of good courage, and exhorted them to place their hopes of victory in God, and to make supplication to him, according to the custom of their country, clothed in sackcloth, and to show what was their usual habit of supplication in the greatest dangers, and thereby to prevail with God to grant you the victory over your enemies. So he set them in their ancient order of battle used by their forefathers, under their captains of thousands, and other officers, and dismissed such as were newly married, as well as those that had newly gained possessions, that they might not fight in a cowardly manner, out of an inordinate love of life, in order to enjoy those blessings. When he had thus disposed his soldiers, he encouraged them to fight by the following speech which he made to them. Quote, o my fellow soldiers, no other time remains more opportune than the present for courage and contempt of dangers. For if you now fight manfully, you may recover your liberty, which, as it is a thing of itself agreeable to all men, so it proves to be to us much more desirable, by its affording us the liberty of worshipping God. 
since therefore you are in such circumstances at present, you must either recover that liberty, and so regain a happy and blessed way of living, which is that according to our laws and the customs of our country, or to submit to the most opprobrious sufferings. Nor will any seat of your nation remain if you be beat in this battle. Fight therefore manfully, and suppose that you must die, though you do not fight. But believe that besides such glorious rewards as those of the liberty of your country, of your laws, of your religion, you shall then obtain everlasting glory. Prepare yourselves, therefore, and put yourselves into such an agreeable posture that you may be ready to fight with the enemy as soon as it is day tomorrow morning. End quote. And this was the speech which Judas made to encourage them. But when the enemy sent Gorgias, with five thousand foot and one thousand horse, that he might fall upon Judas by night, and had for that purpose certain of the runagate Jews as guides, the son of Mattathias perceived it, and resolved to fall upon those enemies that were in their camp, now their forces were divided. When they had therefore supped in good time, and had left many fires in their camp, he marched all night to those enemies that were at Emmaus so that when Gorgias found no enemy in their camp, but suspected that they were retired and had hidden themselves among the mountains, he resolved to go and seek them wheresoever they were. But about break of day, Judas appeared to those enemies that were at Emmaus, with only three thousand men and those ill-armed by reason of their poverty. And when he saw the enemy very well and skillfully fortified in their camp, he encouraged the Jews, and told them that they ought to fight, though it were with their naked bodies, for that God had sometimes of old given such men strength, and that against such as were more in number, and were armed also, out of regard to their great courage. So he commanded the trumpeters to sound for the battle, and by thus falling upon the enemies when they did not expect it, and thereby astonishing and disturbing their minds, he slew many of those that resisted him, and went on pursuing the rest as far as Gadara, and the plains of Idumea, and Ashdod, and Jamnia. And of these there fell about three thousand. Yet did Judas exhort his soldiers not to be too desirous of the spoils, for that still they must have a contest and battle with Gorgias, and the forces that were with him, but that when they had once overcome them, then they might securely plunder the camp, because they were the only enemies remaining, and they expected no others. And just as he was speaking to his soldiers, Gorgias's men looked down into that army which they left in their camp, and saw that it was overthrown, and the camp burnt. For the smoke that arose from it showed them, even when they were a great way off, what had happened. When therefore those that were with Gorgias understood that things were in this posture, and perceived that those that were with Judas were ready to fight them, they also were affrighted and put to flight. But then Judas, as though he had already beaten Gorgias' soldiers without fighting, returned and seized upon the spoils. He took a great quantity of gold and silver and purple and blue, and then returned home with joy, and singing hymns to God for their good success. For this victory greatly contributed to the recovery of their liberty. Hereupon Lysias was confounded at the defeat of the army which he had sent, and the next year he got together sixty thousand chosen men. He also took five thousand horsemen, and fell upon Judea. And he went up to the hill country of Bethsur, a village of Judea, and pitched his camp there, where Judas met him with ten thousand men. And when he saw the great number of his enemies, he prayed to God that he would assist him, and joined battle with the first of the enemy that appeared, and beat them, and slew about five thousand of them, and thereby became terrible to the rest of them. Nay, indeed, Lysias, observing the great spirit of the Jews, how they were prepared to die rather than lose their liberty, and being afraid of their desperate way of fighting, as if it were real strength, he took the rest of the army back with him and returned to Antioch, where he listed foreigners into the service, and prepared to fall upon Judea with a greater army. When, therefore, the generals of Antiochus's armies had been beaten so often, Judas assembled the people together, and told them, that after these many victories which God had given them, 
they ought to go up to Jerusalem and purify the temple, and offer the appointed sacrifices. But as soon as he, with the whole multitude, was come to Jerusalem, and found the temple deserted, and its gates burnt down, and plants growing in the temple of their own accord, on account of its desertion, he and those that were with him began to lament, and were quite confounded at the sight of the temple. So he chose out some of his soldiers, and gave them order to fight against those guards that were in the citadel, until he should have purified the temple. When therefore he had carefully purged it, and had brought in new vessels, the candlestick, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense, which were made of gold, he hung up the veils at the gates, and added doors to them. He also took down the altar of burnt offering, and built a new one of stones that he gathered together, and not of such as were hewn with iron tools. So on the five and twentieth day of the month Caslu, which the Macedonians call Apollaeans, they lighted the lamps that were on the candlestick, and offered incense upon the altar of incense, and laid the loaves upon the table of showbread, and burnt offerings upon the new altar of burnt offering. Now it so fell out, that these things were done on the very same day on which their divine worship had fallen off, and was reduced to a profane and common use, after three years' time. For so it was, that the temple was made desolate by Antiochus, and so continued for three years. This desolation happened to the temple in the hundred forty and fifth year, on the twenty-fifth day of the month Apollaeans, and on the hundred fifty and third Olympiad. But it was dedicated anew on the same day, the twenty-fifth of the month Apollaeans, on the hundred and forty-eighth year, and on the hundred and fifty-fourth Olympiad. And this desolation came to pass according to the prophecy of Daniel, which was given four hundred and eight years before, for he declared that the Macedonians would dissolve that worship for some time. Now Judas celebrated the festival of the restoration of the sacrifices of the temple for eight days, and omitted no sort of pleasures thereon, but he feasted them upon very rich and splendid sacrifices, and he honored God, and delighted them by hymns and psalms. Nay, they were so very glad at the revival of their customs, when, after a long time of intermission, they unexpectedly had regained the freedom of their worship, that they made it a law for their posterity, that they should keep a festival on account of the restoration of their temple worship for eight days. And from that time to this, we celebrate this festival, and call it Lights. I suppose the reason was, because this liberty beyond our hopes appeared to us, and that thence was the name given to that festival. Judas also rebuilt the walls round about the city, and reared towers of great height against the incursions of enemies, and set guards therein. He also fortified the city Bethsura, that it might serve as a citadel against any distresses that might come from our enemies. End of Book 12, Chapters 5-7 through 7. Book 12, Chapters 8 and 9 of The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3, by Flavius Josephus, translated by William Whiston. Book 12, Chapters 8 and 9. Chapter 8. How Judas subdued the nations round about, and how Simon beat the people of Tyre and Ptolemais, and how Judas overcame Timotheus, and forced him to fly away, and did many other things after Joseph and Azarias had been beaten. When these things were over, the nations round about the Jews were very uneasy at the revival of their power, and rose up together, and destroyed many of them, as gaining advantage over them by laying snares for them, and making secret conspiracies against them. Judas made perpetual expeditions against these men, and endeavored to restrain them from those incursions, and to prevent the mischiefs they did to the Jews. So he fell upon the Idumeans, the posterity of Esau, at Acrobatene, and slew a great many of them, and took their spoils. He also shut up the sons of Baon, 
that laid wait for the Jews. And he sat down about them, and besieged them, and burnt their towers, and destroyed the men that were in them. After this he went thence in haste against the Ammonites, who had a great and numerous army, of which Timotheus was the commander. And when he had subdued them, he seized the city Jazer, and took their wives and their children captives, and burnt the city, and then returned into Judea. But when the neighboring nations understood that he was returned, they got together in great numbers in the land of Gilead, and came against those Jews that were at their borders, who then fled to the garrison of Dathema, and sent to Judas to inform him that Timotheus was endeavoring to take the place whither they were fled. And as these epistles were reading, there came other messengers out of Galilee, who informed him that the inhabitants of Ptolemais, and of Tyre and Sidon, and strangers of Galilee, were gotten together. Accordingly, Judas, upon considering what was fit to be done, with relation to the necessity both these cases required, gave order that Simon his brother should take three thousand chosen men, and go to the assistance of the Jews in Galilee, while he and another of his brothers, Jonathan, made haste into the land of Gilead with eight thousand soldiers. And he left Joseph, the son of Zacharias, and Azarias, to be over the rest of the forces, and charged them to keep Judea very carefully, and to fight no battles with any persons whomsoever until his return. Accordingly, Simon went into Galilee and fought the enemy, and put them to flight, and pursued them to the very gates of Ptolemais, and slew about three thousand of them, and took the spoils of those that were slain, and those Jews whom they had made captives, with their baggage, and then returned home. Now as for Judas Maccabeus and his brother Jonathan, they passed over the river Jordan, and when they had gone three days' journey, they lighted upon the Nabataeans, who came to meet them peaceably, and who told them of how the affairs of those in the land of Gilead stood, and how many of them were in distress, and driven into garrisons, and into the cities of Galilee, and exhorted him to make haste to go against the foreigners, and to endeavor to save his own countrymen out of their hands. To this exhortation Judas hearkened, and returned to the wilderness, and in the first place fell upon the inhabitants of Bosor, and took the city, and beat the inhabitants, and destroyed all the males, and all that were able to fight, and burnt the city. Nor did he stop even when night came on, but he journeyed in it to the garrison where the Jews happened to be then shut up, and where Timotheus lay round the place with his army. And Judas came upon the city in the morning. And when he found that the enemy were making an assault upon the walls, and that some of them brought ladders on which they might get upon those walls, and that others brought engines to batter them, he bid the trumpeter to sound his trumpet, and he encouraged his soldiers cheerfully to undergo dangers for the sake of their brethren and kindred. He also parted his army into three bodies, and fell upon the backs of their enemies. But when Timotheus's men perceived that it was Maccabeus that was upon them, of both whose courage and good success in war they formerly had good experience, they were put to flight. But Judas followed them with his army, and slew about eight thousand of them. He then turned aside to a city of the foreigners called Male, and took it, and slew all the males, and burnt the city itself. He then removed from thence, and overthrew Capsham and Bosor, and many other cities of the land of Gilead. But not long after this, Timotheus prepared a great army, and took many others as auxiliaries, and induced some of the Arabians, by the promise of rewards, to go with him in this expedition, and came with his army beyond the brook, over against the city Raphon. And he encouraged his soldiers, if it came to a battle with the Jews, to fight courageously, and to hinder their passing over the brook. For he said to them beforehand, that, If they come over it, we shall be beaten. And when Judas heard that Timotheus prepared himself to fight, he took all his own army, and went in haste against Timotheus, his enemy. And when he had passed over the brook, he fell upon his enemies, and some of them met him, whom he slew, and others of them he so terrified, that he compelled them to throw down their arms and fly, and some of them escaped, but some of them fled to what was called the Temple of Camain, 
and hoped thereby to preserve themselves. But Judas took the city and slew them, and burnt the temple, and so used several ways of destroying his enemies. When he had done this, he gathered the Jews together, with their children and wives, and the substance that belonged to them, and was going to bring them back into Judea. But as soon as he was come to a certain city, whose name was Ephron, that lay upon the road, and it was not possible for him to go any other way, so he was not willing to go back again, he then sent to the inhabitants, and desired that they would open their gates, and permit them to go on their way through the city. For they had stopped up the gates with stones, and cut off their passage through it. And when the inhabitants of Ephron would not agree to this proposal, he encouraged those that were with him, and encompassed the city round, and besieged it, and, lying round it by day and night, took the city, and slew every male in it, and burnt it all down, and so obtained a way through it. And the multitude of those that were slain was so great, that they went over the dead bodies. So they came over Jordan, and arrived at the great plain, over against which is situate the city Bethshah, which is called by the Greeks Scythopolis. And going away hastily from thence, they came into Judea, singing psalms and hymns as they went, and indulging such tokens of mirth as are usual in triumphs upon victory. They also offered thank-offerings, both for their good success and for the preservation of their army, for not one of the Jews was slain in these battles. But as to Joseph, the son of Zacharias, and Azarias, whom Judas left generals of the rest of his forces at the same time when Simon was in Galilee, fighting against the people of Ptolemais, and Judas himself and his brother Jonathan were in the land of Gilead, did these men also affect the glory of being courageous generals in war, in order whereto they took the army that was under their command and came to Jamnia. There Gorgias, the general of the forces of Jamnia, met them, and upon joining battle with him, they lost two thousand of their army and fled away, and were pursued to the very borders of Judea. And this misfortune befell them by their disobedience to what injunctions Judas had given them, not to fight with any one before his return. For besides the rest of Judas's sagacious counsels, one may well wonder at this concerning the misfortune that befell the forces commanded by Joseph and Azarias, which he understood would happen if they broke any of the injunctions he had given them. But Judas and his brethren did not leave off fighting with the Idumeans, but pressed upon them on all sides, and took from them the city of Hebron, and demolished all its fortifications, and set all its towers on fire, and burnt the country of the foreigners, and the city Marissa. They came also to Ashdod, and took it, and laid it waste, and took away a great deal of the spoils and prey that were in it, and returned to Judea. Chapter 9. Concerning the death of Antiochus Epiphanes, how Antiochus Eupator fought against Judas, and besieged him in the temple, and afterwards made peace with him and departed. Of Alcimus and Onias. About this time it was that King Antiochus, as he was going over the upper countries, heard that there was a very rich city in Persia, called Elemes, and therein a very rich temple of Diana, and that it was full of all sorts of donations dedicated to it, as also weapons and breastplates, which, upon inquiry, he found had been left there by Alexander, the son of Philip, king of Macedonia. And being incited by these motives, he went in haste to Elemes, and assaulted it and besieged it. But as those that were in it were not terrified at his assault, nor at his siege, but opposed him very courageously, he was beaten off his hopes, for they drove him away from the city, and went out and pursued after him, insomuch that he fled away as far as Babylon, and lost a great many of his army. And when he was grieving for this disappointment, some persons told him of the defeat of his commanders whom he had left behind him to fight against Judea, and what strength the Jews had already gotten. When this concern about these affairs was added to the former, he was confounded, and by the anxiety he was in fell into a distemper, which, as it lasted a great while, and as his pains increased upon him, 
so he at length perceived he should die in a little time. So he called his friends to him, and told them that his distemper was severe upon him, and confessed withal that this calamity was sent upon him for the miseries he had brought upon the Jewish nation, while he plundered their temple, and contemned their God. And when he had said this, he gave up the ghost. Whence one may wonder at Polybius of Megalopolis, who, though otherwise a good man, yet saith that, quote, Antiochus died because he had a purpose to plunder the temple of Diana in Persia, end quote. For the purposing to do a thing, but not actually doing it, is not worthy of punishment. But if Polybius could think that Antiochus thus lost his life on that account, it is much more probable that this king died on account of his sacrilegious plundering of the temple at Jerusalem. But we will not contend about this matter with those who may think that the cause assigned by this Polybius of Megalopolis is nearer the truth than that assigned by us. However, Antiochus, before he died, called for Philip, who was one of his companions, and made him guardian of his kingdom, and gave him his diadem, and his garment, and his ring, and charged him to carry them and deliver them to his son Antiochus, and desired him to take care of his education, and to preserve the kingdom for him. This Antiochus died in the hundred forty and ninth year, but it was Lysias that declared his death to the multitude, and appointed his son Antiochus to be king, of whom at present he had the care, and called him Eupator. At this time it was that the garrison in the citadel of Jerusalem, with the Jewish runagates, did a great deal of harm to the Jews, for the soldiers that were in that garrison rushed out upon the sudden, and destroyed such as were going up to the temple in order to offer their sacrifices, for this citadel adjoined to and overlooked the temple. When these misfortunes had often happened to them, Judas resolved to destroy that garrison, whereupon he got all the people together and vigorously besieged those that were in the citadel. This was in the hundred and fiftieth year of the dominion of the Seleucids, so he made engines of war, and erected bulwarks, and very zealously pressed on to take the citadel. But there were not a few of the runagates who were in the place that went out by night into the country, and got together some other wicked men like themselves, and went to Antiochus the king, and desired of him that he would not suffer them to be neglected under the great hardships that lay upon them from those of their own nation and this because their sufferings were occasioned on his father's account, while they left the religious worship of their fathers, and preferred that which he had commanded them to follow, that there was danger lest the citadel, and those appointed to garrison it by the king, should be taken by Judas, and those that were with him, unless he would send them succors. When Antiochus, who was but a child, heard this, he was angry, and sent for his captains and his friends, and gave order that they should get an army of mercenaries together, with such men also of his own kingdom, as were of an age fit for war. Accordingly, an army was collected of about a hundred thousand footmen, and twenty thousand horsemen, and thirty-two elephants. So the king took his army, and marched hastily out of Antioch, with Lysias, who had the command of the whole, and came to Idumea, and thence went up to the city Bethsura, a city that was strong, and not to be taken without great difficulty. He set about this city, and besieged it, and while the inhabitants of Bethsura courageously opposed him, and sallied out upon him, and burnt his engines of war, a great deal of time was spent in the siege. But when Judas heard of the king's coming, he raised the siege of the citadel, and met the king, and pitched his camp in certain straits, at a place called beth Zachariah, at the distance of seventy furlongs from the enemy. But the king soon drew his forces from beth -Sura, and brought them to those straits. And as soon as it was day, he put his men in battle array, and made his elephants follow one another through the narrow passes, because they could not be set sideways by one another. Now round about every elephant there were a thousand footmen and five hundred horsemen. The elephants also had high towers upon their backs, and archers in them. And he also made the rest of his army to go up the mountains, and put his friends before the rest, and gave orders for the army to shout aloud, 
and so he attacked the enemy. He also exposed to sight their golden and brazen shields, so that a glorious splendor was sent from them. And when they shouted, the mountains echoed again. When Judas saw this, he was not terrified, but received the enemy with great courage, and slew about six hundred of the first ranks. But when his brother Eleazar, whom they called Auron, saw the tallest of all the elephants armed with royal breastplates, and supposed that the king was upon them, he attacked him with great quickness and bravery. He also slew many of those that were about the elephant, and scattered the rest, and then went under the belly of the elephant, and smote him and slew him. So the elephant fell upon Eleazar, and by his weight crushed him to death. And thus did this man come to his end, when he had first courageously destroyed many of his enemies. But Judas, seeing the strength of the enemy, retired to Jerusalem, and prepared to endure a siege. As for Antiochus, he sent part of his army to Bethsura to besiege it, and with the rest of his army he came against Jerusalem. But the inhabitants of Bethsura were terrified at his strength, and seeing that their provisions grew scarce, they delivered themselves up on the security of oaths that they should suffer no hard treatment from the king. And when Antiochus had thus taken the city, he did them no other harm than sending them out naked. He also placed a garrison of his own in the city. But as for the temple of Jerusalem, he lay at its siege a long time, while they within bravely defended it. For what engines soever the king set against them, they set other engines again to oppose them. But then their provisions failed them. What fruits of the ground they had laid up were spent, and the land being not plowed that year, continued unsowed, because it was the seventh year, on which by our laws we are obliged to let it lay uncultivated. And withal, so many of the besieged ran away for want of necessaries, that but a few only were left in the temple. And these happened to be the circumstances of such as were besieged in the temple. But then, because Lysias, the general of the army, and Antiochus the king, were informed that Philip was coming upon them out of Persia, and was endeavoring to get the management of public affairs to himself, they came into these sentiments to leave the siege, and to make haste to go against Philip. Yet did they resolve not to let this be known to the soldiers or to the officers. But the king commanded Lysias to speak openly to the soldiers and the officers, without saying a word about the business of Philip, and to intimate to them that the siege would be very long, that the place was very strong, that they were already in want of provisions, that many affairs of the kingdom wanted regulation, and that it was much better to make a league with the besieged, and to become friends to their whole nation, by permitting them to observe the laws of their fathers, while they broke out into this war only because they were deprived of them, and so to depart home. When Lysias had discoursed thus to them, both the army and the officers were pleased with this resolution. Accordingly, the king sent to Judas, and to those that were besieged with them, and promised to give them peace, and to permit them to make use of, and live according to, the laws of their fathers. And they gladly received his proposals. And when they had gained security upon oath for their performance, they went out of the temple. But when Antiochus came into it, and saw how strong the place was, he broke his oaths, and ordered his army that was there to pluck down the walls to the ground. And when he had so done, he returned to Antioch. He also carried with him Onias the high priest, who was also called Menelaus. For Lysias advised the king to slay Menelaus, if he should have the Jews be quiet, and cause him no further disturbance, for that this man was the origin of all the mischief the Jews had done them by persuading his father to compel the Jews to leave the religion of their fathers. So the king sent Menelaus to Berea, a city of Syria, and there had him put to death when he had been high priest ten years. He had been a wicked and an impious man, and in order to get the government to himself, had compelled his nation to transgress their own laws. After the death of Menelaus, Alcimus, who was also called Jacimus, was made high priest. 
but when King Antiochus found that Philip had already possessed himself of the government, he made war against him, and subdued him, and took him and slew him. Now as to Onias, the son of the high priest, who, as we before informed you, was left a child when his father died, when he saw that the king had slain his uncle Menelaus, and given the high priesthood to Alcimus, who was not of the high priest's stock, but was induced by Lysias to translate that dignity from his family to another house, he fled to Ptolemy, king of Egypt. And when he found he was in great esteem with him, and with his wife Cleopatra, he desired and obtained a place in the Nomus of Heliopolis, wherein he built a temple like to that at Jerusalem, of which therefore we shall hereafter give an account in a place more proper for it. End of Book 12, Chapters 8 and 9book 12 chapters 10 and 11 of the antiquities of the jews volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the antiquities of the jews volume 3 by flavius josephus translated by william whiston book 12 chapters 10 and 11 chapter 10 how Bacchides, the general of Demetrius's army, made an expedition against Judea, and returned without success, and how Nicanor was sent a little afterward against Judas, and perished, together with his army, as also concerning the death of Alcimus, and the succession of Judas. About the same time Demetrius, the son of Seleucus, fled away from Rome, and took Tripoli, a city of Syria, and set the diadem on his own head. He also gathered certain mercenary soldiers together, and entered into his kingdom, and was joyfully received by all, who delivered themselves up to him. And when they had taken Antiochus the king, and Lysias, they brought them to him alive, both which were immediately put to death by the command of Demetrius, when Antiochus had reigned two years, as we have already elsewhere related. But there were now many of the wicked Jewish runagates that came together to him, and with them Alcimus the high priest, who accused the whole nation, and particularly Judas and his brethren, and said that they had slain all his friends, and that those in his kingdom that were of his party, and waited for his return, were by them put to death, that these men had ejected them out of their own country, and caused them to be sojourners in a foreign land and they desired that he would send some one of his own friends, and know from him what mischief Judas's party had done. At this Demetrius was very angry, and sent Bacchides, a friend of Antiochus Epiphanes, a good man, and one that had been entrusted with all Mesopotamia, and gave him an army, and committed Alcimus the high priest to his care, and gave him charge to slay Judas and those that were with him. So Bacchides made haste, and went out of Antioch with his army. And when he was come into Judea, he sent to Judas and his brethren, to discourse with them about a league of friendship and peace, for he had a mind to take him by treachery. But Judas did not give credit to him, for he saw that he came with so great an army as men do not bring when they come to make peace, but to make war. However, some of the people acquiesced in what Bacchides caused to be proclaimed, and supposing they should undergo no considerable harm from Alcimus, who was their countryman, they went over to them. And when they had received oaths from both of them, that neither they themselves, nor those of the same sentiments, should come to any harm, they entrusted themselves with them. But Bacchides troubled not himself about the oaths he had taken, but slew three score of them, although, by not keeping his faith with those that first went over, he deterred all the rest, who had intentions to go over to him, from doing it. But as he was gone out of Jerusalem, and was at the village called Bethsetho, he sent out and caught many of the deserters, and some of the people also, and slew them all and enjoined all that lived in the country to submit to Alcimus. So he left him there with some part of the army, 
that he might have wherewith to keep the country in obedience, and returned to Antioch to King Demetrius. But Alcimus was desirous to have the dominion more firmly assured to him, and understanding that, if he could bring it about that the multitude should be his friends, he should govern with greater security, he spake kind words to them all, and discoursed to each of them after an agreeable and pleasant manner, by which means he quickly had a great body of men and an army about him, although the greater part of them were of the wicked and the deserters. With these, whom he used as his servants and soldiers, he went all over the country, and slew all that he could find of Judas's party. But when Judas saw that Alcimus was already become great, and had destroyed many of the good and holy men of the country, he also went all over the country, and destroyed those that were of the other party. But when Alcimus saw that he was not able to oppose Judas, nor was equal to him in strength, he resolved to apply himself to King Demetrius for his assistance. So he came to Antioch, and irritated him against Judas, and accused him, alleging that he had undergone a great many miseries by his means, and that he would do more mischief unless he were prevented and brought to punishment, which must be done by sending a powerful force against him. So Demetrius, being already of opinion that it would be a thing pernicious to his own affairs to overlook Judas, now he was becoming so great, sent against him Nicanor, the most kind and most faithful of all his friends. For he it was who fled away with him from the city of Rome. He also gave him as many forces as he thought sufficient for him to conquer Judas withal, and bid him not to spare the nation at all. When Nicanor was come to Jerusalem, he did not resolve to fight Judas immediately, but judged it better to get him into his power by treachery. So he sent him a message of peace, and said there was no manner of necessity for them to fight and hazard themselves, and that he would give him his oath that he would do him no harm, for that he only came with some friends, in order to let him know what King Demetrius's intentions were, and what opinion he had of their nation. When Nicanor had delivered this message, Judas and his brethren complied with him, and suspecting no deceit, they gave him assurances of friendship, and received Nicanor and his army. But while he was saluting Judas, and they were talking together, he gave a certain signal to his own soldiers, upon which they were to seize upon Judas. But he perceived the treachery, and ran back to his own soldiers, and fled away with them. So upon this discovery of his purpose, and of the snares laid for Judas, Nicanor determined to make open war with him, and gathered his army together, and prepared for fighting him. And upon joining battle with him at a certain village called Kafar Salama, he beat Judas, and forced him to fly to that citadel which was at Jerusalem. And when Nicanor came down from the citadel unto the temple, some of the priests and elders met him and saluted him, and showed him the sacrifices which they offered to God for the king, upon which he blasphemed and threatened them, that unless the people would deliver up Judas to him, upon his return he would pull down their temple. And when he had thus threatened them, he departed from Jerusalem." But the priests fell into tears out of grief at what he had said, and besought God to deliver them from their enemies. But now for Nicanor, when he was gone out of Jerusalem, and was at a certain village called Bethoron, he there pitched his camp, another army out of Syria having joined him. And Judas pitched his camp at Adasa, another village, which was thirty furlongs distant from Bethoron having no more than one thousand soldiers. And when he had encouraged them not to be dismayed at the multitude of their enemies, nor to regard how many they were against them whom they were going to fight, but to consider who they themselves were, and for what great rewards they hazarded themselves, and to attack the enemy courageously, he led them out to fight, and joining battle with Nicanor, which proved to be a severe one, he overcame the enemy, and slew many of them. And at last Nicanor himself, as he was fighting gloriously, fell, upon whose fall the army did not stay. 
but when they had lost their general, they were put to flight, and threw down their arms. Judas also pursued them, and slew them, and gave notice by the sound of the trumpets to the neighboring villages that he had conquered the enemy, which, when the inhabitants heard, they put on their armor hastily, and met their enemies in the face as they were running away, and slew them, insomuch that not one of them escaped out of this battle, who were in number nine thousand. This victory happened to fall on the thirteenth day of that month, which is by the Jews called Adar, and by the Macedonians Dystrus. And the Jews thereon celebrate this victory every year, and esteem it as a festival day after which the Jewish nation were for a while free from wars and enjoyed peace. But afterward they returned into their former state of wars and hazards. But now as the high priest Alcimus was resolving to pull down the wall of the sanctuary, which had been there of old time, and had been built by the holy prophets, he was smitten suddenly by God and fell down. This stroke made him fall down speechless upon the ground and undergoing torments for many days, he at length died, when he had been high priest four years. And when he was dead, the people bestowed the high priesthood on Judas, who, hearing of the power of the Romans, and that they had conquered in war Galatia and Iberia, and Carthage and Libya, and that, besides these, they had subdued Greece and their kings, Perseus and Philip, and Antiochus the Great also, he resolved to enter into a league of friendship with them. He therefore sent to Rome some of his friends, Eupolemus the son of John, and Jason the son of Eleazar, and by them desired the Romans that they would assist them, and be their friends, and would write to Demetrius that he would not fight against the Jews. So the Senate received the ambassadors that came from Judas to Rome, and discoursed with them about the errand on which they came, and then granted them a league of assistance. They also made a decree concerning it, and sent a copy of it into Judea. It was also laid up in the capital, and engraven in brass. The decree itself was this, quote, The decree of the Senate concerning a league of assistance and friendship with the nation of the Jews. It shall not be lawful for any that are subject to the Romans to make war with the nation of the Jews, nor to assist those that do so, either by sending them corn or ships or money. And if any attack be made upon the Jews, the Romans shall assist them, as far as they are able. And again, if any attack be made upon the Romans, the Jews shall assist them. And if the Jews have a mind to add to, or to take away anything from, this league of assistance, that shall be done with the common consent of the Romans." and whatsoever addition shall thus be made, it shall be of force. End quote. This decree was written by Eupolemus the son of John, and by Jason the son of Eleazar, when Judas was high priest of the nation, and Simon his brother was general of the army. And this was the first league that the Romans made with the Jews, and was managed after this manner. Chapter 11 that Bacchides was again sent out against Judas, and how Judas fell as he was courageously fighting. But when Demetrius was informed of the death of Nicanor, and of the destruction of the army that was with him, he sent Bacchides again with an army into Judea, who marched out of Antioch, and came into Judea, and pitched his camp at Arbella, a city of Galilee. And having besieged and taken those that were there in caves, for many of the people fled into such places, he removed and made all the haste he could to Jerusalem. And when he had learned that Judas had pitched his camp at a certain village, whose name was Bethzetho, he led his army against him. They were twenty thousand footmen and two thousand horsemen. Now Judas had no more soldiers than one thousand. When these saw the multitude of Bacchides's men, they were afraid, and left their camp, and fled all away, excepting eight hundred. Now when Judas was deserted by his own soldiers, and the enemy pressed upon him, and gave him no time to gather his army together, he was disposed to fight with Bacchides' army, though he had but eight hundred men with him. 
so he exhorted those men to undergo the danger courageously, and encouraged them to attack the enemy. And when they said they were not a body sufficient to fight so great an army, and advised that they should retire now, and save themselves, and that when he had gathered his own men together, then he should fall upon the enemy afterwards, his answer was this, quote, Let not the sun ever see such a thing, that I should show my back to the enemy, and although this be the time that will bring me to my end, and I must die in this battle, I would rather stand to it courageously, and bear whatsoever comes upon me, than by now running away bring reproach upon my former great actions, or tarnish their glory. End quote. This was the speech he made to those that remained with him, whereby he encouraged them to attack the enemy. But Bacchides drew his army out of their camp, and put them in array for the battle. He set the horsemen on both the wings, and the light soldiers and the archers he placed before the whole army, but he was himself on the right wing. And when he had thus put his army in order of battle, and was going to join battle with the enemy, he commanded the trumpeter to give a signal of battle, and the army to make a shout, and to fall on the enemy. And when Judas had done the same, he joined battle with them. And as both sides fought valiantly, and the battle continued till sunset, Judas saw that Bacchides and the strongest part of the army was on the right wing, and thereupon took the most courageous men with him, and ran upon that part of the army, and fell upon those that were there, and broke their ranks, and drove them into the middle, and forced them to run away, and pursued them as far as to a mountain called Aza. But when those of the left wing saw that the right wing was put to flight, they encompassed Judas, and pursued him, and came behind him, and took him into the middle of their army. So being not able to fly, but encompassed round about with enemies, he stood still, and he and those that were with him fought. And when he had slain a great many of those that came against him, he at last was himself wounded, and fell and gave up the ghost, and died in a way like to his former famous actions. When Judas was dead, those that were with him had no one whom they could regard as their commander. But when they saw themselves deprived of such a general, they fled. But Simon and Jonathan, Judas's brethren, received his dead body by a treaty from the enemy, and carried it to the village of Modin, where their father had been buried, and there buried him. While the multitude lamented him many days, and performed the usual solemn rites of a funeral to him. And this was the end that Judas came to. He had been a man of valor and a great warrior, and mindful of the commands of their father Mattathias, and had undergone all difficulties both in doing and suffering for the liberty of his countrymen. And when his character was so excellent while he was alive, he left behind him a glorious reputation and memorial, by gaining freedom for his nation, and delivering them from slavery under the Macedonians. And when he had retained the high priesthood three years, he died. Book 13, Chapters 1 and 2 of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book 13, Chapters 1 and 2. Book 13, containing the interval of 82 years, from the death of Judas Maccabeus to the death of Queen Alexandra. Chapter 1, How Jonathan took the government from his brother Judas, and how he, together with his brother Simon, waged war against Bacchides. By what means the nation of the Jews recovered their freedom when they had been brought into slavery by the Macedonians, and what struggles, and how great battles. Judas, the general of their army, ran through, till he was slain as he was fighting for them, hath been related in the foregoing book. But after he was dead, all the wicked, and those that transgressed the laws of their forefathers, sprang up again in Judea, and grew upon them, and distressed them on every side. 
A famine also assisted their wickedness, and afflicted the country, till not a few, who by reason of their want of necessaries, and because they were not able to bear up against the miseries that both the famine and their enemies brought upon them, deserted their country, and went to the Macedonians. And now Bacchides gathered those Jews together, who had apostatized from the accustomed way of living of their forefathers, and chose to live like their neighbors, and committed the care of the country to them, who also caught the friends of Judas and those of his party, and delivered them up to Bacchides, who when he had, in the first place, tortured and tormented them at his pleasure, he, by that means, at length, killed them. And when this calamity of the Jews was become so great, as they had never had experience of the like since their return out of Babylon, those that remained of the companions of Judas, seeing that the nation was ready to be destroyed after a miserable manner, came to his brother Jonathan, and desired him that he would imitate his brother, and take care which he took of his countrymen, for whose liberty in general he died also, and that he would not permit the nation to be without a governor, especially in those destructive circumstances wherein it now was. And where Jonathan said he was ready to die for them, and esteemed no inferior to his brother, he was appointed to be the general of the Jewish army. When Bacchides heard this, and was afraid that Jonathan might be very troublesome to the king and to the Macedonians, as Judas had been before him, he sought how he might slay him by treachery. But this intention of his was not unknown to Jonathan, nor to his brother Simon. But when these two were apprised of it, they took all their companions, and presently fled into that wilderness which was nearest to the city. And when they were come to a lake called Aspar, they abode there. But when Bacchides was sensible that they were in a low state, and were in that place, he hastened to fall upon them with all his forces, and pitching his camp beyond Jordan, he recruited his army. But when Jonathan knew that Bacchides was coming upon him, he sent his brother John, who was also called Gaddis, to the Nabatean Arabs, that he might lodge his baggage with them until the battle with Bacchides should be over, for they were the Jews' friends. And the sons of Ambri laid an ambush for John from the city of Medaba, and seized upon him, and upon those that were with him, and plundered all that they had with them. They also slew John and all his companions. However, they were sufficiently punished for what they now did by John's brethren, as we shall relate presently. But when Bacchides knew that Jonathan had pitched his camp among the lakes of Jordan, he observed when their Sabbath day came, and then assaulted him, as supposing that he would not fight because of the law for resting on that day. But he exhorted his companions to fight, and told them that their lives were at stake since they were encompassed by the river and by their enemies, and had no way to escape, for that their enemies pressed upon them from before, and the river was behind them. So after he had prayed to God to give them the victory, he joined battle with the enemy, of whom he overthrew many. And as he saw Bacchides coming up boldly to him, he stretched out his right hand to smite him. But the other, foreseeing and avoiding the stroke, Jonathan with his companions leaped into the river, and swam over it, and by that means escaped beyond Jordan while the enemies did not pass over that river. But Bacchides returned presently to the citadel at Jerusalem, having lost about two thousand of his army. He also fortified many cities of Judea, whose walls had been demolished, Jericho and Emmaus, and Bet Boron and Bethel, and Timnah and Farotho, and Tekoa and Gazara, and built towers in every one of these cities, and encompassed them with strong walls, that were very large also, and put garrisons into them, that they might issue out of them, and do mischief to the Jews. He also fortified the citadel at Jerusalem more than all the rest. Moreover, he took the sons of the principal Jews as pledges, and shut them up in the citadel, and in that manner guarded it. About the same time one came to Jonathan, and to his brother Simon, and told them that the sons of Ambri were celebrating a marriage, and bringing the bride from the city of Gabatha, who was the daughter of one of the illustrious men among the Arabians, and that the damsel was to be conducted with pomp, and splendor, and much riches. 
So Jonathan and Simon, thinking this appeared to be the fittest time for them to avenge the death of their brother, and that they had forces sufficient for receiving satisfaction from them for his death, they made haste to Medaba, and lay in wait among the mountains for the coming of their enemies. And as soon as they saw them conducting the virgin, and her bridegroom, and such a great company of their friends with them, as was to be expected at this wedding, they sallied out of their ambush, and slew them, and took their ornaments, and all the prey that then followed them. And so returned, and received this satisfaction for their brother John, from the sons of Ambri. For as well those sons themselves, as their friends, and wives, and children that followed them, perished, being in number about four hundred. However, Simon and Jonathan returned to the lakes of the river, and abode there. But Bacchides, when he had secured all Judea with his garrisons, returned to the king, and then it was that the affairs of Judea were quiet for two years. But when the deserters and the wicked saw that Jonathan and those that were with him lived in the country very quietly, by reason of the peace, they sent to King Demetrius, and excited him to send back Hides to seize upon Jonathan, which they said was to be done without any trouble, and in one night's time. And if they fell upon them before they were aware, they might slay them all. So the king sent back Hides, who, when he was come into Judea, wrote to all his friends, both Jews and auxiliaries, that they should seize upon Jonathan, and bring him to him, and when, upon all their endeavors, they were not able to seize upon Jonathan, for he was sensible of the snares they laid for him, and very carefully guarded against them. Bacchides was angry at these deserters, as having imposed upon him, and upon the king, and slew fifty of their leaders. Whereupon Jonathan, with his brother, and those that were with him, retired to Beth Agla, a village that lay in the wilderness, out of his fear of Bacchides. He also built towers in it, and encompassed it with walls, and took care that it should be safely guarded. Upon the hearing of which, Bacchides led his own army along with him, and besides took his Jewish auxiliaries, and came against Jonathan, and made an assault upon his fortification, and besieged him many days. But Jonathan did not abate of his courage, at the zeal Bacchides used in the siege, but courageously opposed him. And while he left his brother Simon in the city to fight with Bacchides, he went privately out himself into the country, and got a great body of men together of his own party, and fell upon Bacchides' camp in the night time, and destroyed a great many of them. His brother Simon knew also of this his falling upon them, because he perceived that the enemies were slain by him. So he sallied out upon them, and burnt the engines which the Macedonians used, and made a great slaughter of them. When Bacchides saw himself encompassed with enemies, and some of them before and some behind, he fell into despair and trouble of mind, as confounded at the unexpected ill success of this siege. However, he vented his displeasure at these misfortunes upon those deserters who sent for him from the king, as having deluded him. So he had a mind to finish this siege after a decent manner, if it were possible for him to do so, and then return home. When Jonathan understood these his intentions, he sent ambassadors to him about a league of friendship and mutual assistance, and that they might restore those they had taken captive on both sides. But Bacchides thought this a pretty decent way of retiring home, and made a league of friendship with Jonathan, when they swore they would not any more make war one against another. Accordingly, he restored the captives, and took his own men with him, and returned to the king at Antioch. And after this his departure, he never came into Judea again. Then did Jonathan take the opportunity of this quiet state of things, and went and lived in the city of Michmash, and there governed the multitude, and punished the wicked and ungodly, and by this means purged the nation of them. Chapter 2 How Alexander, Bala, in his war with Demetrius, granted Jonathan many advantages, and appointed him to be high priest, and persuaded him to assist him, although Demetrius promised him greater advantages on the other side, concerning the death of Demetrius. Now in the hundred and sixtieth year, it fell out that Alexander, the son of Antiochus Epiphanes, came up into Syria, 
and took Ptolemais, the soldiers within having betrayed it to him, for they were at enmity with Demetrius, on account of his insolence and difficulty of access. For he shut himself up in a palace of his, that had four towers which he had built himself, not far from Antioch, and admitted no one. He was withal slothful and negligent about public affairs, whereby the hatred of his subjects was the more kindled against him, as we have elsewhere already related. Therefore when Demetrius heard that Alexander was in Ptolemais, he took his whole army and led it against him. He also sent ambassadors to Jonathan about a league of mutual assistance and friendship, for he resolved to be beforehand with Alexander, lest the other should treat with him first, and gain assistance from him, and this he did out of fear he had, lest Jonathan should remember how ill Demetrius had formerly treated him, and should join with him in this war against him. He therefore gave orders that Jonathan should be allowed to raise an army, and should get armor made, and should receive back those hostages of the Jewish nation, whom Bacchides had shut up in the citadel of Jerusalem. When this good fortune had befallen Jonathan, by the concession of Demetrius, he came to Jerusalem, and read the king's letter in the audience of the people, and of those who kept the citadel. When these were read, these wicked men and deserters, who were in the citadel, were greatly afraid, upon the king's permission to Jonathan to raise an army, and to receive back the hostages. So he delivered every one of them to his own parents. And thus did Jonathan make his abode at Jerusalem, renewing the city to a better state, and reforming the buildings as he pleased. For he gave orders that the walls of the city should be rebuilt with square stones, and that it might be more secure from their enemies. And when those that kept the garrisons that were in Judea saw this, they all left them and fled to Antioch, excepting those that were in the city Bethshura, and those that were in the citadel of Jerusalem, for the greater part of these was of the wicked Jews and deserters, and on that account these did not deliver up their garrisons. When Alexander knew what promises Demetrius had made Jonathan, and withal knew his courage, and what great things he had done when he fought the Macedonians, and besides what hardships he had undergone by the means of Demetrius and of Bacchides, the general of Demetrius's army, he told his friends that he could not at present find any one else that might afford him better assistance than Jonathan, who was both courageous against his enemies, and had a particular hatred against Demetrius, as having both suffered many hard things from him, and acted many hard things against him. If therefore they were of opinion that they should make him their friend against Demetrius, it was more for their advantage to invite him to assist them now than at another time. It being therefore determined by him and his friends to send to Jonathan, he wrote to him this epistle. King Alexander to his brother Jonathan sendeth greeting. We have long ago heard of thy courage and thy fidelity, and for that reason have sent to thee, to make with thee a league of friendship and mutual assistance. We therefore do ordain thee this day, the high priest of the Jews, and that thou beest called my friend. I have also sent thee, as presents, a purple robe and a golden crown, and desire that, now thou art by us honored, thou wilt in like manner respect us also. When Jonathan had received this letter, he put on the pontifical robe at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, four years after the death of his brother Judas, for at that time no high priest had been made. So he raised great forces, and had abundance of armor got ready. This greatly grieved Demetrius when he heard of it, and made him blame himself for his slowness, that he had not prevented Alexander, and got the good will of Jonathan, but had given him time so to do. However, he also himself wrote a letter to Jonathan, and to the people, the contents whereof are these. King Demetrius to Jonathan, and to the nation of the Jews, sendeth greeting. Since you have preserved your friendship for us, and when you have been tempted by our enemies, you have not joined yourselves to them, I both commend you for this your fidelity, and exhort you to continue in the same disposition, for which you shall be repaid, and receive rewards from us. For I will free you from the greatest part of the tributes and taxes, 
which you formerly paid to the kings my predecessors, and to myself. And I do now set you free from those tributes which you have ever paid, and besides, I forgive you the tax upon salt, and the value of the crowns which you used to offer to me, and instead of the third part of the fruits of the field, and the half of the fruits of the trees, I relinquish my part of them from this day, and as to poll money, which ought to be given me for every head of the inhabitants of Judea, and of the three toparchies that adjoin to Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, and Paris, that I relinquish to you for this time, and for all time to come. I will also that the city of Jerusalem be holy and inviolable, and free from the tithe, and from the taxes, unto its utmost bounds. And I so far recede from my title to the citadel, as to permit Jonathan your high priest to possess it, that he may place such a garrison in it, as he approves of for fidelity and good will to himself, that they may keep it for us. I also make free all those Jews who have been made captives and slaves in my kingdom. I also give order that the beasts of the Jews be not pressed for our service. And let their Sabbaths, and all their festivals, and three days before each of them, be free from any imposition. In the same manner, I set free the Jews that are inhabitants of my kingdom, and order that no injury be done them. I also give leave to such of them, as are willing to list themselves in my army, that they may do it, and those as far as thirty thousand, which Jewish soldiers, wheresoever they go, shall have the same pay that my own army hath. And some of them I will place in my garrisons, and some as guards about my own body, and as rulers over those that are in my court. I give them leave also to use the laws of their forefathers, and to observe them. And I will that they have power over the three toparchies that are added to Judea, that it shall be in the power of the high priest, to take care that no one Jew shall have any other temple for worship, but only that at Jerusalem. I bequeath also, out of my own revenues, yearly, for the expenses about the sacrifices, one hundred and fifty thousand drachma, and what money is to spare, I will that it shall be your own. I also release to you those ten thousand drachma which the kings receive from the temple, because they appertain to the priests that minister in that temple. And whosoever shall fly to the temple at Jerusalem, or to the places thereto belonging, or who owe the king money, or are there on any other account, let them be set free, and let their goods be in safety. I also give you leave to repair and rebuild your temple, and that all be done at my expense. I also allow you to build the walls of your city, and to erect high towers, and that they be erected at my charge. And if there be any fortified town that would be convenient for the Jewish country to have very strong, let it be so built at my expenses. This was what Demetrius promised and granted to the Jews by this letter. But King Alexander raised a great army of mercenary soldiers, and of those that deserted to him out of Syria, and made an expedition against Demetrius. When it was come to a battle, the left wing of Demetrius put those who opposed them to flight, and pursued them a great way, and slew many of them, and spoiled their camp. But the right wing, where Demetrius happened to be, was beaten, and as for all the rest, they ran away. But Demetrius fought courageously, and slew a great many of the enemy. But as he was in the pursuit of the rest, his horse carried him into a deep bog, where it was hard to get out. And there it happened, that upon his horse falling down, he could not escape being killed. For when his enemies saw what had befallen him, they returned back, and encompassed Demetrius round, and they all threw their darts at him. But he, being now on foot, fought bravely. But at length he received so many wounds, that he was not able to bear up any longer, but fell. And this is the end that Demetrius came to, when he had reigned eleven years, as we have elsewhere related. Book 13, Chapters 3 and 4 of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. 
Book 13, Chapters 3 and 4. Chapter 3. The Friendship That Was Between Onias and Ptolemy Philometer, and How Onias Built a Temple in Egypt Like to That at Jerusalem. But then the son of Onias the high priest, who was of the same name with his father, and who fled to King Ptolemy, who was called Philometer, lived now at Alexandria, as we have said already. When this Onias saw that Judea was oppressed by the Macedonians and their kings, out of a desire to purchase to himself a memorial in eternal fame, he resolved to send to King Ptolemy and Queen Cleopatra, to ask leave of them, that he might build a temple in Egypt like to that at Jerusalem, and might ordain Levites and priests out of their own stock. The chief reason why he was desirous so to do was, that he relied upon the prophet Isaiah, who lived above six hundred years before, and foretold that there certainly was to be a temple built to Almighty God in Egypt, by a man that was a Jew. Onias was elevated with this prediction, and wrote the following epistle to Ptolemy and Cleopatra. Having done many and great things for you in the affairs of the war, by the assistance of God, that in Celesyria and Phoenicia, I came at length with the Jews to Leontopolis, and to other places of your nation, where I found that the greatest part of your people had temples in an improper manner, and that on this account they bear ill will one against another, which happens to the Egyptians by reason of the multitude of their temples, and the difference of opinions about divine worship. Now I found a very fit place, in a castle that hath its name with the country Diana. This place is full of materials of several sorts, and replenished with sacred animals. I desire, therefore, that you will grant me leave to purge this holy place, which belongs to no master, and is fallen down, and to build there a temple to Almighty God, after the pattern of that in Jerusalem, and of the same dimensions, that may be for the benefit of thyself, and thy wife and children, that those Jews which dwell in Egypt may have a place whither they may come and meet together in mutual harmony one with another, and he subservient to thy advantages. For the prophet Isaiah foretold that there should be an altar in Egypt to the Lord God. And many other things did he prophesy relating to that place. And this is what Onias wrote to King Ptolemy. Now any one may observe his piety, and that of his sister and wife Cleopatra, by that epistle which they wrote in answer to it. For they lay the blame and the transgression of the law upon the head of Onias. And this was their reply. King Ptolemy and Queen Cleopatra to Onias, send greeting. We have read thy petition, wherein thou desirest leave to be given to thee, to purge that temple which is fallen down in Leontopolis, in the Nomus of Heliopolis, and which is named from the country Bubastis on which account we cannot but wonder that it should be pleasing to God to have a temple erected in a place so unclean and so full of sacred animals. And since thou sayest that Isaiah the prophet foretold this long ago, we give thee leave to do it, if it may be done according to your law, and that we may not appear to have at all offended God herein. So Onias took the place, and built a temple, and an altar to God, like indeed to that in Jerusalem, but smaller and poorer. I do not think it proper for me now to describe its dimensions or its vessels, which have been already described in my seventh book of the Wars of the Jews. However, Onias found other Jews like himself, together with priests and Levites, that there performed divine service. But we have said enough about this temple. Now it came to pass that the Alexandrian Jews, and those Samaritans who paid their worship to the temple that was built in the days of Alexander at Mount Gerizim, did now make a sedition one against another, and disputed about their temples before Ptolemy himself. The Jews saying that, according to the laws of Moses, the temple was to be built at Jerusalem, and the Samaritans saying that it was to be built at Gerizim. They desired therefore the king to sit with his friends, and hear the debates about these matters, and punish those with death who were baffled. Now Sabius and Theodosius managed the argument for the Samaritans, and Andronicus, the son of Mesalamus, for the people of Jerusalem. 
and they took an oath by God and the king to make their demonstrations according to the law, and they desired of Ptolemy, that whosoever he should find, that transgress what they had sworn to, he would put him to death. Accordingly, the king took several of his friends into the council, and sat down, in order to hear what the pleaders said. Now the Jews that were at Alexandria, were in great concern for those men, whose lot it was to contend for the temple at Jerusalem. For they took it very ill that any should take away the reputation of that temple, which was so ancient and so celebrated all over the habitable earth. Now when Sabius and Theodosius had given leave to Andronicus to speak first, he began to demonstrate out of the law and out of the successions of the high priests, how they every one in succession from his father had received that dignity and ruled over the temple and how all the kings of Asia had honored that temple with their donations, and with the most splendid gifts dedicated thereto. But as for that at Gerizim, he made no account of it, and regarded it as if it had never had a being. By this speech, and other arguments, Andronicus persuaded the king to determine that the temple at Jerusalem was built according to the laws of Moses, and to put Sabius and Theodosius to death. And these were the events that befell the Jews at Alexandria in the days of Ptolemy Philometor. Chapter 4 How Alexander honored Jonathan after an extraordinary manner, and how Demetrius, the son of Demetrius, overcame Alexander and made a league of friendship with Jonathan. Demetrius being thus slain in battle, as we have above related, Alexander took the kingdom of Syria, and wrote to Ptolemy Philometor, and desired his daughter in marriage, and said that it was but just, that he should be joined an affinity to one that had now received the principality of his forefathers, and had been promoted to it by God's providence, and had conquered Demetrius, and that was on other accounts not unworthy of being related to him. Ptolemy received this proposal of marriage gladly, and wrote him an answer, saluting him on account of his having received the principality of his forefathers, and promising him that he would give him his daughter in marriage, and assured him that he was coming to meet him at Ptolemais, and desired that he would there meet him, for that he would accompany her from Egypt so far, and would there marry his child to him. When Ptolemy had written thus, he came suddenly to Ptolemais, and brought his daughter Cleopatra along with him. And as he found Alexander there before him, as he desired him to come, he gave him his child in marriage, and for her portion, gave her as much silver and gold as became such a king to give. When the wedding was over, Alexander wrote to Jonathan the high priest, and desired him to come to Ptolemais. So when he came to these kings, and had made them magnificent presents, he was honored by both. Alexander compelled him also to put off his own garment, and to take a purple garment, and made him sit with him in his throne, and commanded his captains that they should go with him into the middle of the city, and proclaim that it was not permitted to anyone to speak against him, or to give him any disturbance. When the captains had thus done, those that were prepared to accuse Jonathan, and who bore him ill will, when they saw the honor that was done him by proclamation, and that by the king's order, ran away, and were afraid lest some mischief should befall them. Nay, King Alexander was so very kind to Jonathan, that he set him down as the principal of his friends. But then, upon the hundred and sixty-fifth year, Demetrius, the son of Demetrius, came from Crete with a great number of mercenary soldiers, which Lasthenes the Cretian brought him, and sailed to Cilicia. This thing cast Alexander into great concern and disorder when he heard it. So he made haste immediately out of Phoenicia, and came to Antioch, that he might put matters in a safe posture there before Demetrius should come. He also left Apollonius Daus, governor of Celesyria, who coming to Jamnia with a great army, sent to Jonathan the high priest, and told him that it was not right that he alone should live at rest, and with authority, and not be subjected to the king, that this thing had made him a reproach among all men, that he had not yet made him subject to the king. Do not thou therefore deceive thyself, 
and sit still among the mountains, and pretend to have forces with thee. But if thou hast any dependence on thy strength, come down into the plain, and let our armies be compared together, and the event of the battle will demonstrate which of us is the most courageous. However, take notice, that the most valiant men of every city are in my army, and that these are the very men who have always beaten thy progenitors. But let us have the battle in such a place of the country where we may fight with weapons, and not with stones, and where there may be no place whither those that are beaten may fly. With this Jonathan was irritated, and choosing himself out of ten thousand of his soldiers, he went out of Jerusalem in haste, with his brother Simon, and came to Joppa, and pitched his camp on the outside of the city, because the people of Joppa had shut their gates against him, for they had a garrison in the city put there by Apollonius. But when Jonathan was preparing to besiege them, they were afraid he would take them by force, and so they opened the gates to him. But Apollonius, when he heard that Joppa was taken by Jonathan, took three thousand horsemen and eight thousand footmen, and came to Ashdod, and removing thence, he made his journey silently and slowly, and going up to Joppa, he made as if he was retiring from the place, and so drew Jonathan into the plain, as valuing himself highly upon his horsemen, and having his hopes of victory principally in them. However, Jonathan sallied out, and pursued Apollonius to Ashdod, but as soon as Apollonius perceived that his enemy was in the plain, he came back and gave him battle. But Apollonius had laid a thousand horsemen in ambush in a valley, that they might be seen by their enemies as behind them, which when Jonathan perceived, he was under no consternation, but ordering his army to stand in a square battle array, he gave them a charge to fall on the enemy on both sides, and set them to face those that attacked them both before and behind. And while the fight lasted till the evening, he gave part of his forces to his brother Simon, and ordered him to attack the enemies. But for himself, he charged those that were with him, to cover themselves with armor, and receive the darts of the horsemen, who did as they were commanded. So that the enemy's horsemen, while they threw their darts till they had no more left, did them no harm. For the darts that were thrown did not enter into their bodies, being thrown upon the shields that were united and conjoined together, the closeness of which easily overcame the force of the darts, and they flew about without any effect. But when the enemy grew remiss in throwing their darts from morning till late at night, Simon perceived their weariness, and fell upon the body of men before him, and because his soldiers showed great alacrity, he put the enemy to flight. And when the horsemen saw that the footmen ran away, neither did they stay themselves, but they being very weary, by the duration of the fight till the evening, and their hope from the footmen being quite gone, they basely ran away, and in great confusion also, till they were separated one from another, and scattered over all the plain. Upon which Jonathan pursued them as far as Ashdod, and slew a great many of them, and compelled the rest, in despair of escaping, to fly to the temple of Dagon, which was at Ashdod. But Jonathan took the city on the first onset, and burnt it, and the villages about it. Nor did he abstain from the temple of Dagon itself, but burnt it also, and destroyed those that had fled to it. Now the entire multitude of the enemies that fell in the battle, and were consumed in the temple, were eight thousand. When Jonathan therefore had overcome so great an army, he removed from Ashdod, and came to Ascalon. And when he had pitched his camp without the city, the people of Ascalon came out and met him, bringing him hospitable presents, and honoring him. So he accepted of their kind intentions, and returned thence to Jerusalem with a great deal of prey, which he brought thence when he conquered his enemies. But when Alexander heard that Apollonius, the general of his army, was beaten, he pretended to be glad of it, because he had fought with Jonathan his friend and ally against his directions. Accordingly, he sent to Jonathan, and gave testimony to his worth, and gave him honorary rewards, as a golden button, which it is the custom to give the king's kinsmen, and allowed him Ekron and its toparchy for his own inheritance. About this time it was that King Ptolemy, who was called Philometor, led an army, 
part by the sea and part by land, and came to Syria, to the assistance of Alexander, who was his son-in-law. And accordingly all the cities received him willingly, as Alexander had commanded them to do, and conducted him as far as Ashdod, where they all made loud complaints about the temple of Dagon, which was burnt, and accused Jonathan of having laid it waste, and destroyed the country adjoining with fire, and slain a great number of them. Ptolemy heard these accusations, but said nothing. Jonathan also went to meet Ptolemy as far as Joppa, and obtained from him hospitable presents, and those glorious in their kinds, with all the marks of honor, and when he had conducted him as far as the river called Eleutherus, he returned again to Jerusalem. But as Ptolemy was at Ptolemais, he was very near to a most unexpected destruction, for a treacherous design was laid for his life by Alexander, by the means of Ammonius, who was his friend, and as the treachery was very plain, Ptolemy wrote to Alexander, and required of him that he should bring Ammonius to consign punishment, informing him what snares had been laid for him by Ammonius, and desiring that he might be accordingly punished for it. But when Alexander did not comply with his demands, he perceived that it was he himself who laid the design, and was very angry at him. Alexander had also formerly been on ill terms with the people of Antioch, for they had suffered very much by his means. Yet did Ammonius at length undergo the punishment his insolent crimes had deserved, for he was killed in an approbious manner, like a woman, while he endeavored to conceal himself in a feminine habit, as we have elsewhere related. Hereupon Ptolemy blamed himself for having given his daughter in marriage to Alexander, and for the league he had made with him to assist him against Demetrius. So he dissolved his relation to him, and took his daughter away from him, and immediately sent to Demetrius, and offered to make a league of mutual assistance and friendship with him, and agreed with him to give him his daughter in marriage, and to restore him to the principality of his fathers. Demetrius was well pleased with this embassage, and accepted of his assistance, and of the marriage of his daughter. But Ptolemy had still one more hard task to do, and that was to persuade the people of Antioch to receive Demetrius, because they were greatly displeased with him, on account of the injuries his father Demetrius had done them. Yet did he bring this about, for as the people of Antioch hated Alexander on Ammonius's account, as we have shown already, they were easily prevailed with to cast him out of Antioch, who, thus expelled out of Antioch, came into Cilicia. Ptolemy came then to Antioch, and was made king by its inhabitants, and by the army, so that he was forced to put on two diadems, the one of Asia, the other of Egypt. But being naturally a good and righteous man, and not desirous of what belonged to others, and besides these dispositions, being a wise man in reasoning about futurities, he determined to avoid the envy of the Romans. So he called the people of Antioch together to an assembly, and persuaded them to receive Demetrius, and assured them that he would not be mindful of what they did to his father, in case he should be now obliged by them. And he undertook that he would himself be a good monitor and governor to him, and promised that he would not permit him to attempt any bad actions but that, for his own part, he was contented with the kingdom of Egypt. By this discourse he persuaded the people of Antioch to receive Demetrius. But now Alexander made haste with a numerous and great army, and came out of Cilicia into Syria, and burnt the country belonging to Antioch, and pillaged it. Whereupon Ptolemy and his son-in-law Demetrius brought their army against him, for he had already given him his daughter in marriage, and beat Alexander, and put him to flight. And accordingly he fled into Arabia. Now it happened in the time of the battle, that Ptolemy's horse, upon hearing the noise of an elephant, cast him off his back, and threw him on the ground. Upon the sight of which accident, his enemies fell upon him, and gave him many wounds upon his head, and brought him into danger of death. For when his guards caught him up, he was so very ill, that for four days' time he was not able either to understand or to speak. However, Zabdiel, a prince among the Arabians, cut off Alexander's head, and sent it to Ptolemy, 
who recovering of his wounds, and returning to his understanding, on the fifth day, heard at once a most agreeable hearing, and saw a most agreeable sight, which were the death and the head of Alexander. Yet a little after this, his joy for the death of Alexander, with which he was so greatly satisfied, he also departed this life. Now Alexander, who was called Balas, reigned over Asia five years, as we have elsewhere related. But when Demetrius, who was styled Nicator, had taken the kingdom, he was so wicked as to treat Ptolemy's soldiers very hardly, and neither remembering the league of mutual assistance that was between them, nor that he was his son-in-law and kinsman, by Cleopatra's marriage to him. So his soldiers fled from his wicked treatment to Alexandria, but Demetrius kept his elephants. But Jonathan the high priest levied an army out of all Judea, and attacked the citadel at Jerusalem, and besieged it. It was held by a garrison of Macedonians, and by some of those wicked men who had deserted the customs of their forefathers. These men at first despised the attempts of Jonathan for taking the place, as depending on its strength. But some of those wicked men went out by night, and came to Demetrius, and informed him that the citadel was besieged who was irritated with what he heard, and took his army, and came from Antioch against Jonathan. And when he was at Antioch, he wrote to him, and commanded him to come to him quickly to Ptolemais. Upon which Jonathan did not intermit the siege of the citadel, but took with him the elders of the people, and the priests, and carried with him gold and silver and garments, and a great number of presents of friendship, and came to Demetrius, and presented him with them, and thereby pacified the king's anger. So he was honored by him, and received from him the confirmation of his high priesthood, as he had possessed it by the grants of the kings his predecessors. And when the Jewish deserters accused him, Demetrius was so far from giving credit to them, that when he petitioned him that he would demand no more than three hundred talents for the tribute of all Judea, and the three toparchies of Samaria, and Perea and Galilee, he complied with the proposal, and gave him a letter confirming all those grants, whose contents were as follows. King Demetrius to Jonathan his brother, and to the nation of the Jews, sendeth greeting. We have sent you a copy of that epistle, which we have written to Lasthenes our kinsman, that you may know its contents. King Demetrius to Lasthenes our father, sendeth greeting. I have determined to return thanks, and to show favor to the nation of the Jews, which hath observed the rules of justice in our concerns. Accordingly, I remit to them the three prefectures, Aphirims and Lydda, and Ramatha, which have been added to Judea out of Samaria, with their appurtenances, as also what the kings my predecessors received from those that offered sacrifices in Jerusalem, and that are due from the fruits of the earth, and of the trees, and what else belongs to us, with the salt pits, and the crowns that used to be presented to us. Nor shall they be compelled to pay any of those taxes from this time to all futurity. Take care, therefore, that a copy of this epistle be taken and given to Jonathan, and be set up in an eminent place of their holy temple. And these were the contents of this writing. And now when Demetrius saw that there was peace everywhere, and that there was no danger, nor fear of war, he disbanded the greatest part of his army, and dismissed their pay, and even retained in pay, no others than such foreigners as came up with him from Crete, and from other islands. However, this procured him ill will and hatred from the soldiers, on whom he bestowed nothing from this time, while the kings before him used to pay them in time of peace as they did before, that they might have their good will, and that they might be very ready to undergo the difficulties of war, if any occasion should require it. End of Book 13, Chapters 3 and 4book 13 chapters 5 and 6 of the antiquities of the jews volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by anne boulet the antiquities of the jews volume 3 by flavius josephus 
Translated by William Whiston. Book 13, Chapters 5 and 6. Chapter 5. How Trypho, after he had beaten Demetrius, delivered the kingdom to Antiochus, the son of Alexander, and gained Jonathan for his assistant, and concerning the actions and embassies of Jonathan. Now there was a certain commander of Alexander's forces, an Apennian by birth, whose name was Diodotus, and was also called Trypho, took notice the ill will of the soldiers bear to Demetrius, and went to Malchus the Arabian, who brought up Antiochus, the son of Alexander, and told him what ill will the army bear Demetrius, and persuaded him to give him Antiochus because he would make him king, and recover to him the kingdom of his father. Malchus at first opposed him in this attempt, because he could not believe him. But when Trypho laid hard at him for a long time, he over-persuaded him to comply with Trypho's intentions and entreaties. And this was the state Trypho was now in. But Jonathan the high priest, being desirous to get clear of those that were in the citadel of Jerusalem, and of the Jewish deserters, and wicked men, as well as of those in all the garrisons in the country, sent presents and ambassadors to Demetrius, and entreated him to take away his soldiers out of the strongholds of Judea. Demetrius made answer that after the war, which he was now deeply engaged in, was over, he would not only grant him that, but greater things than that also and he desired that he would send him some assistance, and informed him that his army had deserted him. So Jonathan chose out three thousand of his soldiers, and sent them to Demetrius. Now the people of Antioch hated Demetrius, both on account of what mischief he had done himself them, and because they were enemies also on account of his father Demetrius, who had greatly abused them. So they watched some opportunity which they might lay hold on to fall upon him. And when they were informed of the assistance that was coming to Demetrius from Jonathan, and considered at the same time that he would raise a numerous army, unless they prevented him, and seized upon him, they took their weapons immediately, and encompassed his palace in the way of a siege, and seizing upon all the things of getting out, they sought to subdue their king. And when he saw that the people of Antioch were become his bitterest enemies, and that they thus were in arms, he took the mercenary soldiers which he had with them, and those Jews who were sent by Jonathan, and assaulted the Antiochans. But he was overpowered by them, for they were many ten thousands, and was beaten. But when the Jews saw that the Antiochans were superior, they went up to the top of the palace, and shot at them from thence. And because they were so remote from them by their height, that they suffered nothing on their side, but did great execution on the others, as fighting from such an elevation, they drove them out of the adjoining houses, and immediately set them on fire, whereupon the flame spread itself over the whole city, and burnt it all down. This happened by reason of the closeness of the houses, and because they were generally built of wood. So the Antiochians, when they were not able to help themselves, nor to stop the fire, were put to flight. And as the Jews leaped from the top of one house to the top of another, and pursued them after that manner, it thence happened that the pursuit was so very surprising. But when the king saw that the Antiochians were busy in saving their children and their wives, and so did not fight any longer, he fell upon them in the narrow passages, and fought them, and slew a great many of them, till at last they were forced to throw down their arms, and to deliver themselves up to Demetrius. So he forgave them this their insolent behavior, and put an end to the sedition. And when he had given rewards to the Jews out of the rich spoils he had gotten, and had returned them thanks, as the cause of his victory, he sent them away to Jerusalem to Jonathan, with an ample testimony of the assistance they had afforded him. Yet did he prove an ill man to Jonathan afterward, and broke the promises he had made, and he threatened that he would make war upon him, unless he would pay all that tribute which the Jewish nation owed to the first kings of Syria. And this he had done, if Trypho had not hindered him, and diverted his preparations against Jonathan to a concern of his own preservation, for he now returned out of Arabia into Syria, with the child Antiochus, for he was yet in age but a youth, and put the diadem on his head. 
and as the whole forces that had left Demetrius, because they had no pay, came to his assistance, he made war upon Demetrius, and joining battle with him, overcame him in the fight, and took from him both his elephants and the city Antioch. Demetrius, upon this defeat, retired into Cilicia, but the child Antiochus sent ambassadors and an epistle to Jonathan, and made him his friend and confederate, and confirmed to him the high priesthood, and yielded up to him the four prefectures which had been added to Judea. Moreover, he sent him vessels and cups of gold and a purple garment, and gave him leave to use them. He also presented him with a golden button, and styled him one of his principal friends, and appointed his brother Simon to be the general over the forces, from the latter of Tyre unto Egypt. So Jonathan was so pleased with these grants made him by Antiochus, that he sent ambassadors to him and to Trypho, and professed himself to be their friend and confederate, and said he would join with him in a war against Demetrius informing him that he had made no proper returns for the kindness he had done him, for that when he had received many marks of kindness from him, when he stood in great need of them, he, for such good turns, had requited him with further injuries. So Antiochus gave Jonathan leave to raise himself a numerous army out of Syria and Phoenicia, and to make war against Demetrius's generals. Whereupon he went in haste to several cities which received him splendidly indeed, but put no forces into his hands. And when he was come from thence to Ascalon, the inhabitants of Ascalon came and brought him presents, and met him in a splendid manner. He exhorted them, and every one of the cities of Celesyria, to forsake Demetrius and to join with Antiochus, and, in assisting him, to endeavor to punish Demetrius for what offenses he had been guilty of against themselves, and told them there were many reasons for that their procedure, if they had a mind so to do. And when he had persuaded those cities to promise their assistance to Antiochus, he came to Gaza, in order to induce them also to be friends to Antiochus. But he found the inhabitants of Gaza much more alienated from him than he expected, for they had shut their gates against him. And although they had deserted Demetrius, they had not resolved to join themselves to Antiochus. This provoked Jonathan to beseech them and to harass their country. For as he set a part of his army round about Gaza itself, so with the rest he overran their land, and spoiled it, and burnt what was in it. When those of Gaza saw themselves in this state of affliction, and that no assistance came to them from Demetrius, that what distressed them was at hand, but what should profit them was still at a great distance, and it was uncertain whether it would come at all or not. They thought it would be prudent conduct to leave off any further continuance with them, and to cultivate friendship with the other. So they sent to Jonathan, and professed they would be his friends, and afford him assistance. For such is the temper of men, that before they have had the trial of great afflictions, they do not understand what is for their advantage. But when they find themselves under such afflictions, they then change their minds, and what it had been better for them to have done, before they had been at all damaged, they chose to do, but not till after they have suffered such damages. However, he made a league of friendship with them, and took from them hostages for their performance of it, and sent these hostages to Jerusalem, while he went himself over all the country, as far as Damascus. And when he had heard that the generals of Demetrius's forces were come to the city of Kadesh with a numerous army, the place lies between the land of the Tyrians and Galilee, for they supposed they should hereby draw him out of Syria in order to preserve Galilee, and that he would not overlook the Galileans, who were his own people, when war was made upon them. He went to meet them, having left Simon in Judea, who raised as great an army as he was able out of the country, and then sat down before Bethsura and besieged it, that being the strongest place in Judea. And a garrison of Demetrius is kept it, as we have already related. But as Simon was raising banks, and bringing his engines of war against Bethsura, and was very earnest about sieging it, the garrison was afraid lest the place should be taken of Simon by force, and they put to the sword. So they sent to Simon, and desired security of his oath, that they should come to no harm from him, 
and that they would leave the place and go away to Demetrius. Accordingly, he gave them his oath and ejected them out of the city, and he put therein a garrison of his own. But Jonathan removed out of Galilee and from the waters which are called Gennesar, for there he was before encamped and came into the plain that is called Azor, without knowing that the enemy was there. When therefore Demetrius's men knew a day beforehand that Jonathan was coming against them, they laid an ambush in the mountain, who were to assault him on the sudden, while they themselves met him with an army in the plain. Which army, when Jonathan saw ready to engage him, he also got ready his own soldiers for the battle as well as he was able. But those that were laid in ambush by Demetrius's generals being behind them, the Jews were afraid lest they should be caught in the midst between two bodies, and perish. So they ran away in haste, and indeed all the rest left Jonathan. But a few there were, in number about fifty, who stayed with him, and with them Mattathias, the son of Absalom, and Judas, the son of Chapseus, who were the commanders of the whole army. These marched boldly, and like men desperate, against the enemy, and so pushed them that by their courage they daunted them, and with their weapons in their hands they put them to flight. And when those soldiers of Jonathan that had retired saw the enemy giving way, they got together after their flight and pursued them with great violence. And this they did as far as Kadesh, where the camp of the enemy lay. Jonathan, having thus gotten a glorious victory and slain two thousand of the enemy, returned to Jerusalem. So when he saw that all his affairs prospered according to his mind, by the providence of God, he sent ambassadors to the Romans, being desirous of renewing that friendship which their nation had with them formerly. He enjoined the same ambassadors, that, as they came back, they should go to the Spartans, and put them in mind of their friendship and kindred. So when the ambassadors came to Rome, they went into their senate, and said what they were commanded by Jonathan the high priest to say, how he had sent them to confirm their friendship. The senate then confirmed what had been formerly decreed concerning their friendship with the Jews, and gave them letters to carry to all the kings of Asia and Europe, and to the governors of the cities, that they might safely conduct them to their own country. Accordingly, as they returned, they came to Sparta, and delivered the epistle which they had received of Jonathan to them, a copy of which here follows. Jonathan, the high priest of the Jewish nation, and the senate, and the body of the people of the Jews, to the ephori, and senate, and people of the Lacedaemonians, send greeting. If you be well, and both your public and private affairs be agreeable to your mind, it is according to our wishes. We are well also. When in former times an epistle was brought to Onias, who was then our high priest, from Arius, who at that time was your king, by Demoteles, concerning the kindred that was between us and you, a copy of which is here subjoined, we both joyfully received the epistle, and were well pleased with Demoteles and Arius, although we did not need such a demonstration, because we were satisfied about it from the sacred writings and yet we did not think fit first to begin the claim of this relation to you, lest we should seem too early in taking to ourselves the glory which is now given us by you. It is a long time since this relation of ours to you hath been renewed, and when we, upon holy and festival days, offer sacrifices to God, we pray to him for your preservation and victory. As to ourselves, although we have had many wars that have encompassed us around, by reason of the covetousness of our neighbors. Yet did not we determine to be troublesome either to you, or to others that were related to us. But since we have now overcome our enemies, and have occasion to send Numenius, the son of Antiochus, and Antipater, the son of Jason, who are both honorable men belonging to our senate, to the Romans, we gave them this epistle to you also, that they might renew that friendship which is between us. You will therefore do well yourselves to write to us, and send us an account of what you stand in need of from us, since we are in all these things disposed to act according to your desires. So the Lacedaemonians received the ambassadors kindly, and made a decree for friendship and mutual assistance, and sent it to them. At this time there were three sects among the Jews, who had different opinions concerning human actions. 
the one was called the sect of the pharisees another the sect of the sadducees and the other sect of the essenes now for the pharisees they say that some actions but not all are the work of fate and some of them are in our own power and that they are liable to fate but are not caused by fate but the sect of the essenes affirm that fate governs all things and that nothing befalls men what is according to its determination and for the sadducees they take away fate and say there is no such thing and that the events of human affairs are not at its disposal but they suppose that all our actions are in our own power so that we are ourselves the causes of what is good and receive what is evil from our own folly however i have given a more exact account of these opinions in the second book of the jewish war but now the generals of demetrius being willing to recover the defeat they had had gathered a greater army together than they had before and came against jonathan but as soon as he was informed of their coming he went suddenly to meet them to the country of hamath for he resolved to give them no opportunity of coming into judea so he pitched his camp at fifty furlongs distance from the enemy and sent out spies to take a view of their camp and after what manner they were encamped when his spies had given him full information and had seized upon some of them by night who told him the enemy would soon attack him he thus apprised beforehand provided for his security and placed watchmen beyond his camp and kept all his forces armed all night and he gave them a charge to be of good courage and to have their minds prepared to fight in the night time if they should be obliged so to do lest their enemies designs should seem concealed from them but when demetrius's commanders were informed that jonathan knew what they intended their counsels were disordered and it alarmed them to find that the enemy had discovered those their intentions nor did they expect to overcome them any other way now they had failed in the snares they had laid for them for should they hazard an open battle they did not think they should be a match for jonathan's army so they resolved to fly and having lighted many fires that when the enemy saw them they might suppose they were still there they retired when jonathan came to give them battle in the morning in their camp and found it deserted and understood they fled he pursued them yet he could not overtake them for they had already passed over the river elotherus and were out of danger so when jonathan was returned thence he went into arabia and fought against the nabataeans and drove away a great deal of their prey and took many captives and came to damascus and there sold off what he had taken about the same time it was that simon his brother went over all judea and palestine as far as ascalon and fortified the strongholds and when he had made them very strong both in the edifices erected and in the garrisons placed in them he came to joppa and when he had taken it he brought a great garrison into it for he heard that the people of joppa were disposed to deliver up the city to demetrius's generals when simon and jonathan had finished these affairs they returned to jerusalem where jonathan gathered all the people together and took counsel to restore the walls of jerusalem and to rebuild the wall that encompassed the temple which had been thrown down and to make the places adjoining stronger by very high towers and besides that to build another wall in the midst of the city in order to exclude the market-place from the garrison which was in the citadel and by that means to hinder them from any plenty of provisions and moreover to make the fortresses that were in the country much stronger and more defensible than they were before and when these things were approved of by the multitude as rightly proposed jonathan himself took care of the building that belonged to the city and sent simon away to make the fortresses in the country more secure than formerly but demetrius passed over euphrates and came into mesopotamia as desirous to retain that country still as well as babylon and when he should have obtained the dominion of the upper provinces to lay a foundation for recovering his entire kingdom for those greeks and macedonians who dwelt there frequently sent ambassadors to him and promised that if he would come to them they would deliver themselves up to him and assist him in fighting against arsaces the king of the parthians so he was elevated from these hopes and came hastily to them as having resolved that if he had once overthrown the parthians and gotten an army of his own 
he would make war against Trypho and eject him out of Syria, and the people of that country received him with great alacrity. So he raised forces with which he fought against Arsaces and lost all his army, and was himself taken alive, as we have elsewhere related. Chapter 6 How Jonathan was slain by treachery, and how thereupon the Jews made Simon their general and high priest. What courageous actions he also performed, especially against Trypho. Now when Trypho knew what had befallen Demetrius, he was no longer firm to Antiochus, but contrived by subtlety to kill him, and then take possession of his kingdom. But the fear that he was in of Jonathan was an obstacle to this his design, for Jonathan was a friend to Antiochus, for which cause he resolved first to take Jonathan out of the way, and then to set about his design relating to Antiochus. But he, judging it best to take him off by deceit and treachery, came from Antioch to Bethshane, which by the Greeks is called Scythopolis, at which place Jonathan met him with forty thousand chosen men, for he thought that he came to fight him. But when he perceived that Jonathan was ready to fight, he attempted to gain him by presence and kind treatment, and gave order to his captains to obey him, and by these means was desirous to give assurance of his good will, and to take away all suspicions out of his mind, that so he might make him careless and inconsiderate, and might take him when he was unguarded. He also advised him to dismiss his army, because there was no occasion for bringing it with him when there was no war, but all was at peace. However, he desired him to retain a few about him, and go with him to Ptolemais, for that he would deliver the city up to him, and bring all the fortresses that were in the country under his dominion. And he told him that he came with those very designs. Yet did not Jonathan suspect anything at all by this his management, but believed that Trypho gave him this advice out of kindness, and with a sincere design. Accordingly, he dismissed his army, and retained no more than three thousand of them with him, and left two thousand in Galilee. And he himself, with one thousand, came with Trypho to Ptolemais. But when the people of Ptolemais had shut their gates, as it had been commanded by Trypho to do, he took Jonathan alive, and slew all that were with him. He also sent soldiers against those two thousand that were left in Galilee, in order to destroy them. But those men, having heard the report of what had happened to Jonathan, they prevented the execution. And before those that were sent by Trypho came, they covered themselves with their armor, and went away out of the country. Now when those that were sent against them saw that they were ready to fight for their lives, they gave them no disturbance, but returned back to Trypho. But when the people of Jerusalem heard that Jonathan was taken, and that the soldiers who were with him were destroyed, they deplored his sad fate. And there was earnest inquiry made about him by everybody, and a great and just fear fell upon them, and made them sad, lest, now they were deprived of the courage and conduct of Jonathan, the nations about them should bear them ill will. And as they were before quiet on account of Jonathan, they should now rise up against them, and by making war with them, should force them into the utmost dangers. And indeed what they suspected really befell them, for when those nations heard of the death of Jonathan, they began to make war with the Jews as now destitute of a governor. And Trypho himself got an army together, and had intention to go up to Judea, and make war against its inhabitants. But when Simon saw that the people of Jerusalem were terrified at the circumstances they were in, he desired to make a speech to them, and thereby rendered them more resolute in opposing Trypho when he should come against them. He then called the people together into the temple, and thence began thus to encourage them. O oh, my countrymen, you are not ignorant that our father, myself, and my brethren have ventured to hazard our lives, and that willingly, for the recovery of your liberty. Since I have therefore such plenty of examples before me, and we of our family have determined with ourselves to die for our laws and our divine worship. There shall no terror be so great as to banish this resolution from our souls, nor to introduce in its place a love of life and a contempt of glory. Do you therefore follow me with alacrity whithersoever I shall lead you, as not destitute of such a captain as is willing to suffer and to do the greatest things for you? 
For neither am I better than my own brethren, that I should be sparing of my own life, nor so far worse than they, as to avoid and refuse what they thought the most honorable of all things. I mean, to undergo death for your laws, and for that worship of God which is peculiar to you. I will therefore give such proper demonstrations as will show that I am their own brother, and I am so bold as to expect that I shall avenge their blood upon our enemies, and deliver you all with your wives and children from the injuries they intend against you, and, with God's assistance, to preserve your temple from destruction by them. For I see that these nations have you in contempt, as being without a governor, and that they thence are encouraged to make war against you. By this speech of Simon he inspired the multitude with courage, and as they had been before dispirited through fear, they were now raised to a good hope of better things, insomuch that the whole multitude of the people cried out all at once that Simon should be their leader, and that instead of Judas and Jonathan his brethren, he should have the government over them, and they promised that they would readily obey him in whatsoever he should command them. So he got together immediately all his own soldiers that were fit for war, and made haste in rebuilding the walls of the city, and strengthening them by very high and strong towers, and sent a friend of his, one Jonathan, the son of Absalom, to Joppa, and gave him order to eject the inhabitants out of the city, for he was afraid lest they should deliver up the city to Trypho, but he himself stayed to secure Jerusalem. But Trypho removed from Ptolemais with a great army, and came into Judea, and brought Jonathan with him in bonds. Simon also met him with his army at the city of Adida, which is upon a hill, and beneath it lie the plains of Judea. When Trypho knew that Simon was by the Jews made their governor, he sent to him, and would have imposed upon him by deceit and treachery, and desired, if he would have his brother Jonathan released, that he would send him a hundred talents of silver, and two of Jonathan's sons as hostages, that when he shall be released, he may not make Judea revolt from the king. For that at present he was kept in bonds on account of the money he had borrowed of the king, and now owed it to him. But Simon was aware of the craft of Trypho, and although he knew that if he gave him the money he should lose it, and that Trypho would not set his brother free, and withal should deliver the sons of Jonathan to the enemy. Yet because he was afraid that he should have a calumny raised against him among the multitude as the cause of his brother's death, if he neither gave the money nor sent Jonathan's sons, he gathered his army together and told them what offers Trypho had made, and added this, that the offers were ensnaring and treacherous, and yet that it was more eligible to send the money and Jonathan's sons, than to be liable to the imputation of not complying with Trypho's offers, and thereby refusing to save his brother. Accordingly, Simon sent the sons of Jonathan and the money. But when Trypho had received them, he did not keep his promise, nor set Jonathan free, but took his army and went about all the country, and resolved to go afterward to Jerusalem by way of Idumea, while Simon went over against him with his army, and all along pitched his own camp over against his. But when those that were in the citadel had sent to Trypho, and besought him to make haste and come to them, and to send them provisions, he prepared his cavalry as though he would be at Jerusalem that very night. But so great a quantity of snow fell in the night, that it covered the roads, and made them so deep, that there was no passing, especially for the cavalry. This hindered him from coming to Jerusalem, whereupon Trypho removed thence, and came into Celesyria, and falling vehemently upon the land of Gilead, he slew Jonathan there, and when he had given order for his burial, he returned himself to Antioch. However, Simon sent some to the city Basca, to bring away his brother's bones, and bury them in their own city Modin, and all the people made great lamentation over him. Simon also erected a very large monument for his father and his brethren, of white and polished stone, and raised it a great height, and so it was to be seen a long way off, and made cloisters about it and set up pillars, which were of one stone apiece, a work it was wonderful to see. Moreover, he built seven pyramids also for his parents and his brethren, one for each of them, which were made very surprising, both for their largeness and beauty, and which have been preserved to this day. 
and we know that it was Simon who bestowed so much zeal about the burial of Jonathan, and the building of these monuments for his relations. Now Jonathan died when he had been high priest four years, and had been also the governor of his nation, and these were the circumstances concerning his death. But Simon, who was made high priest by the multitude, on the very first year of his high priesthood, set his people free from their slavery under the Macedonians, and permitted them to pay tribute to them no longer. Which liberty and freedom from tribute they obtained after a hundred and seventy years of the kingdom of the Assyrians, which was after Seleucus, who was called Nicator, got the dominion over Syria. Now the affection of the multitude toward Simon was so great, that in their contracts one with another, and in their public records, they wrote, In the first year of Simon the benefactor and enthnarch of the Jews, for under him they were very happy, and overcame the enemies that were round about them. For Simon overthrew the city Gazara, and Joppa, and Jamnis. He also took the citadel of Jerusalem by siege, and cast it down to the ground, that it might not be any more a place of refuge to their enemies when they took it, to do them a mischief, as it had been till now. And when he had done this, he thought it their best way, and most for their advantage, to level the very mountain itself upon which the citadel happened to stand, that so the temple might be higher than it. And indeed, when he had called the multitude to an assembly, he persuaded them to have it so demolished, and this by putting them in mind what miseries they had suffered by its garrison and the Jewish deserters, and what miseries they might hereafter suffer, in case any foreigner should obtain the kingdom and put a garrison into that citadel. This speech induced the multitude to a compliance, because he exhorted them to do nothing but was for their own good. So they all set themselves to the work, and leveled the mountain, and in that work spent both day and night without any intermission, which cost them three whole years before it was removed, and brought to an entire level with the plain of the rest of the city. After which the temple was the highest of all the buildings, now the citadel, as well as the mountain whereon it stood, were demolished. And these actions were thus performed under Simon. End of Book 13, Chapters 5 and 6。Book 13, Chapters 7 through 9 of the Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3, by Flavius Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book 13, Chapters 7 through 9. Chapter 7. How Simon confederated himself with Antiochus Pius, and made war against Trypho, and a little afterward, against Sendebius, the general of Antiochus's army, as also how Simon was murdered by his son-in-law Ptolemy, and that by treachery. Now a little while after Demetrius had been carried into captivity, Trypho his governor destroyed Antiochus, the son of Alexander, who was also called the God, and this when he had reigned four years, though he gave it out that he died under the hands of the surgeons. He then sent his friends, and those that were most intimate with him, to the soldiers, and promised that he would give them a great deal of money if they would make him king. He intimated to them that Demetrius was made a captive by the Parthians, and that Demetrius's brother Antiochus, if he came to be king, would do them a great deal of mischief, in way of revenge for their revolting from his brother. So the soldiers, in expectation of the wealth they should get by bestowing the kingdom on Trypho, made him their ruler. However, when Trypho had gained the management of affairs, he demonstrated his disposition to be wicked, for while he was a private person, he cultivated familiarity with the multitude, and pretended to great moderation, and so drew them on artfully to whatsoever he pleased. But when he had once taken the kingdom, he laid aside any further dissimulation, and was the true Trypho, which behavior made his enemy superior to him, 
for the soldiery hated him and revolted from him to Cleopatra, the wife of Demetrius, who was then shut up in Seleucia with her children. But as Antiochus, the brother of Demetrius, who was called Soter, was not admitted by any of the cities on account of Trypho, Cleopatra sent to him and invited him to marry her and to take the kingdom. The reasons why she made this invitation were these, that her friends persuaded her to do it, and that she was afraid for herself, in case some of the people of Seleucia should deliver up the city to Trypho. As Antiochus was now come to Seleucia, and his forces increased every day, he marched to fight Trypho, and having beaten him in battle, he ejected him out of the upper Syria into Phoenicia, and pursued him thither, and besieged him in Dora, which was a fortress hard to be taken, whither he had fled. He also sent ambassadors to Simon the Jewish high priest, about a league of friendship and mutual assistance, who readily accepted of the invitation, and sent to Antiochus great sums of money and provisions for those that besieged Dora, and thereby supplied them very plentifully, so that for a little while he was looked upon as one of his most intimate friends. But still Trypho fled from Dora to Apamia, where he was taken during the siege and put to death, when he had reigned three years. However, Antiochus forgot the kind assistance that Simon had afforded him in his necessity, by reason of his covetous and wicked disposition, and committed an army of soldiers to his friend Sendivius, and sent him at once to ravage Judea, and to seize Simon. When Simon heard of Antiochus's breaking his league with him, although he were now in years, yet provoked with the unjust treatment he had met with from Antiochus, and taking a resolution brisker than his age could well bear, he went like a young man to act as general of his army. He also sent his sons before among the most hardy of his soldiers, and he himself marched on with his army another way, and laid many of his men in ambushes in the narrow valleys between the mountains. Nor did he fail of success in any one of his attempts, but was too hard for his enemies in every one of them. So he led the rest of his life in peace, and did also make himself a league with the Romans. Now he was the ruler of the Jews in all eight years, but at a feast came to his end. It was caused by the treachery of his son-in-law Ptolemy, who caught also his wife and two of his sons, and kept them in bonds. He also sent some to kill John the third son, whose name was Hyrcanus. But the young man perceiving them coming, he avoided the danger he was in from them, and made haste into the city Jerusalem, as relying on the good will of the multitude, because of the benefits they had received from his father, and because of the hatred the same multitude bare to Ptolemy, so that when Ptolemy was endeavoring to enter the city by another gate, they drove him away, as having already admitted Hyrcanus.